Here we are. Uh, this is the uh, long-awaited moment, Frazier versus Ali. <laughs> we have Curtis Yarvin and Ben Burgess here to debate or have a discussion about with some disagreements. How about that as a way of putting it? Over this thing called democracy, which we've already been talking about. I talked to Ben first for an hour about his feelings, and really, we're talking about feelings today. His feelings about democracy, and then I talked to Curtis about his feelings about democracy. The funny thing is, neither one of them would tell me what their feelings were. Did you notice that? Um, but I'd like to hear more about that. Uh, but first, we are gonna just let Ben respond to what Curtis said, because Curtis was the last to go, and Ben was listening, and I'm, I, the whole time I, was, I had you in my mind, I was wondering what was happening in your mind, and you told me you have a lot to say about it, so let's hear it. What, how would you like, what did you hear, and what would you like to say in response to it? Sure, so my feeling is that I've never heard somebody try so hard to interpret somebody who fundamentally disagrees with them as somehow agreeing with them, mm. as I heard you did with Curtis, mm. that, um, you might both dislike democracy, but for opposite reasons, mm. right? You dislike it for anarchist reasons. You think, you know, you, you don't like too much authority over you. Curtis thinks that the government doesn't have enough authority to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. And the part I found particularly fascinating about that was that the tour through American history, where all of the people that you seem to regard as, as the supervillains of American history um, said, we don't like democracy, because democracy leads to chaos and it doesn't let us uh, control people as much as we want and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't let us uh, get stuff done. And so they move to less democratic things. Uh, the move from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution, those early capital P progressives you talked about. Mm -hmm. And so all of this really seemed like Curtis giving you the hard pitch about why Thad should love democracy uh, because this is all, look at all this anti-democratic stuff that was done to make, to make government less democratic by all the people you most hate. Mm -hmm. um, and then if it wasn't clear enough what the difference is between an anarchist critique of democracy and a monarchist critique of democracy, it got real clear. We started talking about cops. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, think if you, I think if you love cops, you and an anarchist are going to have a fundamental disagreement with each other. Mm -hmm. And one thing I would point out is if you think about cops and you think about the way we interact with cops and how those interactions can be bad, um, then I think that you know, fundamentally bespeaks this power imbalance that uh, you know that there's a much more limited range of what you can get away with when you're interacting with a cop. There is what then a cop can get away with when they're interacting with you. And you know what would help with that a little bit is if you had not just like symbolic oversight boards that can't really do anything, that are toothless, but ones that were really empowered to, to fire people, to, to, you know, to discipline cops in serious ways that most civilian oversight boards are. In other words, more democracy. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that Curtis was actually convincing me to like compliance, to, to abide by I mean, the authorities, whether they're democratic or not, because I just wanted to say this, my heroes, my greatest heroes are American slaves. Why? Because we have lots of evidence of this and it's in my book and elsewhere that, you know, when they were working in the field, they'd be working in lines, right? And there would be a, a driver, a slave driver, overseeing them on a horse usually and looking down on them and he'd ride his horse up and down the row looking to see if they were working. And of course, and Frederick Douglass actually reported on this, as soon as the slave driver passed a slave and had his back to the slave, the slave would drop his head and stop, and stop working. And this was reported on by many people. Mm -hmm. This is a phenomenon, right? And we have, there's a lot of examples of slaves doing the kind of thing that we have called tacit resistance, or I've called it tacit resistance, right? Just doing just enough to not get punished, just enough to not get whipped. And to me, that seems like the healthiest, maybe, way to live, at least from my point of view, according to my values. And it sounds to me like you and I might agree on this, and therefore, I'm not such an anarchist. Um, I might be more of a monarchist, or whatever that is. I'm not sure it's monarchism that I'm advocating, but it is this kind of, it is the compliance with authority. So to a degree, but again, without, and this may be where you and I, dis, Curtis and I disagree, is 
people tend to, as I said, merge their identities with authority, and that can sometimes be corporations, right? Some people are like Apple people, and they love putting the Apple logo on everything, right? Sometimes they merge their identities with the Democratic Party or with the United States of America, and that's, to me, the problem. I don't want to do that because then I feel like I've lost all autonomy. But maybe you're counseling, Curtis, that that's maybe best, is that we should give up on this idea of personal autonomy, and so therefore, what Ben is saying about anarchists not being okay with this, maybe doesn't make sense. Oh, uh, wow, there's a, there's a lot to talk about here. Uh, I'm wondering if I should keep using my Ronald Reagan voice. I, I think I'll, uh, <laughs> um, the, the, yeah, it's, it's sort of, it, I think it's reflective, uh, your perspective is reflective of how much leftism is sort of kind of buried in the heart of libertarianism in some ways because what we see if you can kind of step outside of the 19th and 20th century perspective and interpret modern populations from a fundamentally pre-modern sense, you will see that they're obsessed with autonomy and they're obsessed with essentially atomization and autonomy and atomization really go together and are the same kind of process. And so your sense, for example, when you're dealing with um, like a police officer of inherently wanting to resist that authority, that would be seen by more traditional societies as a very pathological kind of bias or way to approach that situation. And, uh, you know, I would, I would uh, sort of advise two things. One is that I think sort of historically it looks bad. Secondly, it's like, it was it a Dave Chappelle or a Chris Rock skit, like how not to get your ass beat by the police. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that watching that, that skit should be mandatory for, for everyone. And, uh, will stop you from having bad encounters with the police. And, uh, you know, I just, I, I don't believe in having bad encounters with the police. Uh, you know, on the other hand, when you look at, you know, there's a sort of use of the word democracy to mean stuff that I like, which I think is very insidious and Orwellian and very, very wrong. So, for example, to use an uh, opposing use of the word democracy, there uh, was a blog that I really loved called Second City Cop, mm. which was a Chicago cop blog. It was amazing. It was the true voice of people who actually work in the police. It was run by cops. All the commenters were cops. They were very literate and funny cops. Unfortunately, uh, this uh, blog had been, you know, the target of the... Um, sort of progressive media machine in Chicago for quite some time and they came too close to the guy running it and he shut it down. And, you know, so is that democracy in action? Well, you know, it's certainly the action of the same people who would be running these oversight boards. And so in practice, what you're seeing, for example, with this is that when you see, you know, what you'll look at when you see, look at a place like Chicago is you'll see massive violations of human rights going on constantly because these are violations of the basic governmental responsibility to maintain a monopoly of violence. And what the maintaining the monopoly of violence means is that you are responsible for all violence that happens. Even if that is interpersonal violence that does not involve a cop, that violence is the responsibility of the state. Uh, and there's a, con you know the concept of anarcho-tyranny, Ben? Um, it's the sort of the, the, you know, you have this idea that's kind of, st if you're kind of thinking of terms and things in terms of autonomy, you get sort of very confused because I'm like, I'm like against the state or like for the state, should there be like more government or less government? What, you know, this concept of anarcho-tyranny, um, 
which is a Sam Francis concept, I believe, tells us is that these things are actually go quite together. And so the principle of your life is not safe on the street really comes along with the principle of your life is enmeshed in, enmeshed in sort of pointless paperwork. Or your life is not safe on the street comes with the principle of, for example, the real impact of these kinds of oversight processes is depolicing. Because what you see is that basically you reach a certain point where any, like, I, and I believe this is a problem in Chicago now, actually, although I can't really follow it because the only media I trusted got shut down. But the, you know, once you reach a certain point where any kind of interaction with, that may result in some kind of criminal apprehension generates a pile of paperwork, people just, cops just don't do that anymore. They just sit and eat donuts. And so they sit and eat donuts and basically condone just this insane level of violence that goes on. You know, I was reading, um, uh, one of the, the ways I like to explore the past is by reading travelogues of like European travelers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's a great one called um, Outremer by Paul, um, damn it, I'm forgetting the last name. And he travels to Chicago in the 1890s, and he's really disturbed, basically, as a, as a modern Victorian European coming to America because he's heard that sometimes there are robberies within the city limits of Chicago, <laughs> even in the daytime. <laughs> this is something that is unheard of in like a major Victorian city. These places were as safe as Tokyo is now. And so, you know, we see this massive, you know, decline in standards of public order and massive like flight of people from violence. And, you know, to say that, you know, the, the, somehow the problem there is excessive policing is, like, completely cockeyed to me. Okay. Well, uh, I think that the statistics, certainly, um, on police violence do tell a very different story. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, certainly the global comparative statistics on police violence Tell a uh, tell a very different uh, story than that, and you know I agree. By the way, I'm all for you using the Reagan voice because because uh, that is a reminder that you know because Ronald Reagan, man, that is that is somebody who uh, who was committed to governing, didn't let Congress push him around and tell him that he couldn't uh, he couldn't send uh, you know arms uh, from uh, from Iran to uh, to fund uh, to fund terrorists in Nicaragua mm -hmm. uh, so uh, if if you were a big fan of a strong executive I guess that is your guy uh, mm -hmm. but uh, but I think that what were there are two issues with policing just to stick with that example for a second one is democracy and uh, I agree I don't think we should use democracy to mean stuff we like I think we should use it to mean the people having more control over the, you know, the people who uh, exercise power over them, the people who exercise that power being more accountable to, uh, to the governed. I don't think shutting down a blog uh, particularly, uh, particularly helps with that. I think that meaningful democracy requires people having access to a wide variety of points of view so they can make up their own mind. But absolutely, having a real oversight board with real power I think uh, does increase democracy. By the way, what has the least democratic accountability and hence the most worry about how you're going to be treated in those interactions with cops that Thad was talking about, how worried he was earlier, is if it's um, like the corporation from RoboCop mm -hmm. has, uh, has, you know, has just gotten the police contract and then you know, they don't need to worry about what you think at all, right? Any more than like um, miners had to, you know, like Pinkertons had to worry about what miners thought about them mm -hmm. in the 19th century. Now, I agree with Curtis, of course, that... Do I, think that, uh, do I think that people have a right to safety? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do I think that like, having a harsher uh, regime of policing is a particularly effective way of, uh, of enforcing that? I think if you compare different cities in the US uh, with, uh, with different levels, you know, different criminal justice policies, I'm not convinced of that. But hey, you know where you're really safe on the streets? Norway, Sweden, Finland, places mm -hmm. like that, which have vastly more lenient, more humane, more minimalistic criminal justice systems. What else Anders, is the difference between Chicago and Norway? The, uh, I, think <laughs> that the, I think the difference that actually matters, you can tell yourself a just-so story about culture or race that doesn't really make any sense, mm. but I think the difference that's actually relevant is the reason that they can have a vastly more humane and minimalistic criminal justice system. Anders Breivik is getting out of prison eventually, 
uh, and while he's still in, it's much nicer than American prisons. And they can also have a much lower rate of street violence is that social democracy works. That having a, a big, expansive welfare state, regulatory state tied to strong unions with you know, much more egalitarian social consequences results in much less crime, even with a vastly more lenient criminal justice system, which I do think is a win for democracy. So then another, another place with an unfortunately very high crime rate is um, Haiti. And as you may know, Haiti has been in the news lately because uh, the State Department is proposing its uh, nth uh, invasion of Haiti. Uh, how, would you, how would you propose applying your Norwegian model to yeah. uh, Haiti? Well, I think that Haiti makes my point, so thank you for that, mm. as much as would be humanly possible to do with any example in the world, because if you wanted to pick the single country in the world that was least like a Nordic social democracy, it would be Haiti, which, you know, frankly, vastly more closely resembles anarcho-capitalism. Run that last part past sure. me again. They have a, uh, that, uh, that Haiti, how much of a welfare state does Haiti, uh, does Haiti have? How much of a regulatory state does Haiti have? One of the things in the WikiLeaks cables, uh, the State Department cables that, uh, that were uh, released, uh, that, uh, that were leaked, uh, is that there was, a, uh, there was an effort uh, during the uh, first Obama term to increase the minimum wage in Haiti to, I believe, the princely sum of about $5 US a day uh, that was successfully lobbied <laughs> against, among others, by uh, the American State Department on behalf of, uh, of American companies. Right. That's about as weak a regulatory state as you could hope for. Power is wildly dispersed. Again, have this you, is one of you, the least you, social democratic countries on the planet. Do you suppose that's a cause or an effect? Uh, have you spent a lot of time at, in like the third world? Have you, like, I actually, when I was six or seven and seven, I lived in the Dominican Republic, which is next door to Haiti. Um, I'm sort of wondering how, like why you think that this model mm -hmm. has not been more widely applied in the third world, given the fact that, that, that these policies can turn Haiti into Norway. Well, I don't, I don't think that uh, your lived experience of, uh, of being there is actually very relevant. I think what's relevant is the trivially available public data that you yourself just recited a minute ago, right? The nth intervention in Haiti that they, uh, that uh, like Jean Bertrand Aristide when he, uh, when he ran for president of Haiti, uh, his original campaign slogan, swear I'm not making this up, was that he wanted to raise the Haitian people from misery to poverty, right? This is a very, um, this is a very unambitious reform program, right? This is the, the most minimal effort at some kind of lefty reform program you could get, but you try that shit in America's Monroe Doctrine backyard and you end up getting stuff like Aristide being literally kidnapped and taken out of the country by US Marines in 2004. You broaden your view beyond Haiti uh, and you start looking at the rest of the Western Hemisphere uh, south of the United States. You see, for example, you wanna talk about attempts to implement something like a Nordic model. You see Salvador Allende in, uh, in Chile. Uh, being a democratic socialist, uh, get a president, uh, being, being killed and removed in a coup that's, that's very openly supported by the United States. Uh, you, see, you, know, you see that in Guatemala in 54. You, uh, you see that uh, versions of that in Haiti numerous times. Uh, this is not ancient Cold War history. Uh, I mentioned Haiti in 2004. We could also talk about Venezuela in 2002. Mm. Unsuccessful attempt. We could also talk about the, um, we could also talk about Honduras in uh, 2009. Let's, can we you know, actually, I think. Can so, we... so it's like, so I think that there is a pattern that emerges here and I understand you don't want to see it, but like this is a really clear well, pattern. The, yeah, the, the, pattern is, the pattern is one that I'm sort of very familiar with, with from my experiences with that neat reader. Um, my dad was a foreign service officer and worked in the State Department for many years. Uh, his first post was the Dominican Republic, which was the, uh, the site of, of one of these interventions. I think if you, I think it's very possible to take that view when you look at um, a sort of very high and blurry level at these things when you, sort of descend a little bit 
deeper into, for example, the Nelson Rockefeller era of, um, you know, he was the coordinator of Inter-American Affairs, which means he was basically the sort of proconsul for Latin America. Um, you'll see, for example, let's take, for example, the example of Allende versus Pinochet in Chile. Uh, what you'll see if you do what's called a prosopography, which is an analysis of social co network connections, is that Allende is, I would say, much, much more of an American figure than Pinochet. Pinochet is a very Chilean figure. Even in Argentina, he would have been weird. Allende is a globalist. He's a member of basically the global Americanized elite. You know, one time I had, um, in the early 2000s, before I acquired some of my uh, political direction, I had a boss who was Brazilian. He was actually Brazilian Chinese. And one day he came to me and he's like, you know, you know, what's really strange is that, like, my wife is a documentary filmmaker, and so she's kind of part of this world, and she's, like, very Americanized, and she hates America. And my brother-in-law runs a video store and he loves George W. Bush. And, and, you know, how does this come about? And I'm like, you know, it's very simple. The most Americanized people in the world are the most anti-American. Uh, and and you'll find you'll find this a, pattern. You'll category. find this pattern among kind of Latin American elites everywhere. And so, from my perspective, the State Department in its Latin American policies is actually very much guided by a sort of mix between kind of the Orthodox school of Latin American studies kind of program that we've been hearing from you and reality. And so if you take, for example, the case of Aristide in Haiti, uh, the idea of a $5 a, a, a day minimum wage in the country where the average wage is probably 75 cents a day would go very, very far toward ruining what is left of the Haitian economy. And when you look at Aristide in particular, uh, there's a lot that um, reminds us of, for example, um, our good friend, Comandante um, Chavez, uh, and that um, you know, Chavez managed to take uh, Venezuela. Chavez managed to escape all of this alleged you know, CIA, you know, uh, Exxon Mobil plotting and actually run his own country in Latin America and with great advice from the uh, more radical wing of the School of Latin American Studies and the Sandalistas, if you know the term, and all those kinds of people. And the result was that he, t he basically took the country in Latin America with the most resources and turned it into this incredible pit. And so, you know, the idea of doing that same kind of maneuver in a country without oil uh, would have been, uh, you know, sort of extremely remarkable. And, and you can bet your socks that among the people in the State Department who sort of countenanced the, the withdrawal of Aristide that there was not a Republican among them. There are no Republicans in the State Department, zero. Like, if they exist, they, they, they spend their time deep in the closet. Moreover, I can, I can, and I'd be happy to point you to a link that basically, you know, far from being, you simply don't notice all of the times that, from this perspective, that America has gone out and evangelized the, quote, non-communist left. You know, all of the, you know, Kennedy going down to Latin America in the 60s and supporting opera, Alliance for Progress in Peru and saying things like the only alternative to violent revolution is peaceful revolution. You're gonna get a revolution whether you like it or not, guys. And, you know, the, the sheer amount, I mean, this is all, goes on with, with Wilson's intervention in Veracruz in Mexico, where Wilson basically, you have this, um, Porfirio Diaz, who, you know, basically anything that works in Mexico was either created by colonialism or by what were called the Cientificos of Diaz. Diaz retires, you know, and he's like, okay, I want this guy, um, was it Maduro, uh, you know, basically this other thug to replace me. And America is like, oh no, we must not have thugs. And so, you know, you basically get this kind of classic um, Wilson-Debs split between American candidates 
in Mexico where the Wilsonites support Cardenas and the real hotheads, the John Reed types, support Pancho Villa. The, um, your heroes would definitely be all be on the Villa side. And the result is this incredible Mexican civil war that kills like two or three million people and reduces the country to a state of anarchy that it has not yet escaped from. And so, you know, when I compare, you know, the American, America's guilt in promoting leftism in Latin America, which by the way goes all the way back to the original Monroe Doctrine, because the original Monroe Doctrine was a policy inspired by England. It was really an English policy that was treating us as a satellite state. And the goal of that policy was to assure commercial dominance for English um, merchants, capitalists, uh, in Latin America. This is why soccer is such a big thing in Buenos Aires. And, and it worked very well at that. And the policy was basically no monarchs no European monarchs in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And then the Brazilians tried to have their own monarchy, which was actually kind of freaking cool, being emperor of Brazil and all that. And then the policy was, and of course, you had the um, affair of Maximilian in Mexico, which was only possible due to the Civil War. As soon as the Civil War is over, um, the Americans are like, hey, Louis Napoleon, like, didn't you read the paper? Like, we have a huge army here, and we're ready to invade Mexico if you don't get rid of this empire. So Mexico had to go back to, like, broken third world government. And so, you know, the sort of influence of basically imposing leftist systems on what was originally the peaceful and happy empire of New Spain is, for me, basically the sort of cause of all these troubles. Yeah, so most of that's wrong. Porfirio Diaz uh, did not retire. Uh, he, uh, he was overthrown uh, after fixing an election to get himself, uh, get himself re-elected. Uh, he, uh, he, was, uh, he was overthrown. He, uh, he died in Europe, still plotted his unsuccessful return to power. Cardenas, you're talking about, didn't come in until the 1930s, a couple decades. Oh, no, no, no. You're talking about a different Cardenas. Uh, okay. I don't, okay. I don't think so, but people can, you know, people can I'm look at this. I'm talking about the constitutionalist uh, in... in um, in the, the, that Wilson C was supporting. Certainly, uh, certainly the um, the initial uh, the initial legitimately elected government immediately after Perfirio Diaz uh, was overthrown uh, with uh, with direct result with uh, with very direct participation from the U.S. ambassador in Mexico. Another of those famous examples of America promoting leftism in Latin America, which is very much the opposite of what most of the track record is. We also heard a bunch of things that. I'm not quite sure how they all fit together or how they're supposed to be relevant to the original point. The original point being that even very mildly reformist left governments in Latin America are very hard to keep going in the face of American, uh, American state opposition. Now we heard that people in the State Department are Democrats instead of Republicans. I don't know why that distinction would be relevant to anything. Of course this stuff is bipartisan. Uh, you know, LBJ, look at what he did in the Dominican Republic, for example. Uh, I've never had the slightest doubt America, about American empire being a bipartisan project. We heard that, no, 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 uh, social democratic policies would have been a disaster there. So I guess it's good that they couldn't be implemented in these various cases. None of this is particularly relevant to the original point, which is that if you look at economic models, what you have in a place like Haiti is the polar opposite of something like the Nordic countries with their strong labor unions, strong reg regulatory state, extremely expansive welfare state, and the latter works a whole lot better than uh, the former in delivering those basic goods of a more reasonable, less authoritarian criminal justice system mm -hmm. married to a low crime rate. And you really think that nobody has ever had the idea of using the Norwegian system of government in Haiti? Like you're, you're convinced of that? When on earth did I say that? Did I did I just say uh, that and, and black out? Uh, like uh, like I I never. In fact, what I said be, what I you, said is almost literally the opposite of that, Curtis. What I said is that attempts at doing things that fall way short of that were not allowed to happen. Uh, there there's a, there's well I mean uh, you know. I mean, if we go back to the Haitian Revolution, my God, um, you know, certainly that was allowed to happen. Uh, that was that was some uh, pretty. Uh, um, you should read uh, Lothrop Stoddard's uh, "The French Revolution in San Domingo." Um, it's a really it's a really amazing work. And the no, I mean, you know, the, this this reminds me of the sort of the the yeah, story. Yeah, of the, the, the Haitian the Revolution story, was allowed to happen. The story and of that the, they were forced to pay reparations to France. Uh, 
up until the 20th century. So if you want to know something about the economic origins of the distinction between Haiti and Norway, that might be a place to start. Right, because they were, they were paying off their relatively small national debt. It's true, they don't have oil there. Uh, they do have sugar, though. Uh, yeah, I mean... Yeah, they they, you had, know, they the, had to pay reparations to their former slave owners for the loss of property in the slave revolution. That's what happened. Like, yeah, and the genocide. And, and the... Um, but yeah, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, it, num the number of people that we're talking about there it's is small. It's like, tiny. As now, Stalin, in comparison to what you know, you mentioned. Stalin, I, I really, I really enjoyed when you, when you mentioned George W. Bush earlier, because if you want an executive mm. who's not going to let himself be pushed around by Congress, who's going to get stuff done, uh, like detaining American citizens uh, without trial, like starting a worldwide torture regime, a like starting torture starting, regime. Uh, starting a drone war. That's your dude, unitary executive. I hope everybody enjoys let's, the results. Let's go back instead of debating. I recently mentioned that for many years, I drank several cups of coffee a day, and that about a year ago, I started to experience an irregular heartbeat from it. My doctor told me very directly that I needed to cut down on my caffeine intake. Amazingly, Shortly after that, the folks at Magic Mind got in touch with me. Apparently, their CEO had had the same issue, and he started the company to address it. He and his team of nutritionists developed a new herbal supplement that comes in a delicious two-ounce shot, which has replaced coffee in my morning routine. It contains matcha from Japan, which gives me exactly the right kind of long-lasting but not edgy stimulation that keeps me focused and going, as well as several amazing adaptogens, and nootropics sourced from India and British Columbia that keep my stress in check and my mind on task. Best of all, my irregular heartbeat is gone. Now, I start every day with my shot of magic mind. And now that I've been using it for several months, I can report a significant increase in productivity. The book manuscript that I was having a famously difficult time finishing is now complete. Right now, my friends at Magic Mind are offering listeners of Unregistered an unprecedented offer. You should go to magicmind.co slash unregistered and get 40% off your subscription for the next 10 days with my code unregistered20. Again, to get this phenomenal deal on the best part of my morning routine, go to magicmind.co slash unregistered and use my discount code unregistered20. Thank you. Everybody enjoys let's, the result. Let's go back, instead of debating Latin American history, let's go back to Ben's original point, which is twofold, I think, here, is that, number one, I think you're positing that social democracy is the vehicle for democracy, mm -hmm. right? Um, but then also you then said that the, I think you said, the, the United States state, the American state, has been hostile to, uh, to social democratic movements abroad. Is that right? And it sounds like it's inherently to you, that the U.S. state is inherently hostile to social democracy in other countries. That, I, think, I, think that the, I think that the U.S. state is inherently hostile to anything that's bad for American business interests, uh, and that they well, certainly, in what it's traditionally regarded as its backyard, it's been very violently hostile to anything perceived as, as well, getting in the way of American business interests. So let me, let me give a little history, which is not Latin America, but it is... U.S. foreign policy thinker. So, I mean, Franklin Roosevelt's whole intention with World War II was to export the New Deal to Europe, and then that's exactly what happened with the Marshall Plan, right? And also, LBJ and Eisenhower both, that had, they had the exact same intention for Vietnam. They said, we want to bring the TVA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, to the Mekong Delta. They wanted to develop these countries in all sorts of ways, and one of them was to just simply establish New Deal type social democratic political structures in those countries. So there's, and also, I mean, the, the social democracies that you like so much in, in Northern Europe have been the greatest allies, the staunchest allies of the United States, and the United States has, has loved them. No, definitely not. I mean, look, no, uh, no absolutely not. Uh, they have a look at the, uh, the relationship between, uh, between some of the, the most significant social democratic leaders in Northern Europe, look at some of what they were saying about Vietnam. Uh, you know, they have, uh, there's, you know, like, I, I, don't think, I don't think the staunchest allies claim is true. I mean, now, if you want to do the more, the more minimal claim, right, that they have a, 
that sure, I mean, the United States may be happy to work with countries that, you know, especially ones over which it's in a position to exert very little direct control, but for that can benefit uh, the United States in all sorts of ways. Uh, geopolitically is happy to work with places that might have a variety of internal regimes. Yeah, of course, right? But I also think that really, especially if we're gonna talk about social democracy, um, yeah, I mean, I know I've you know, read Robert Caro, I know that, I know that LBJ expressed some fond you know, thoughts yeah. about you know, who'd be great if we had the yeah, TVA in the Mekong Delta. I think if you actually look at the uh, regime that we were propping up in, in Vietnam, it, it did not do a lot of stuff like that. But, the, uh, but I think that you know, more broadly, when we talk about social democracy, what we're really talking about is not just sort of any kind of reform that might include some element of welfareism. I mean, you certainly have that coming from all sorts of sources that are totally separate from that. I mean, you've got you know, Bismarck you know, establishing some basic uh -huh. social insurance. Uh, and what we're talking about is stuff that comes out of the labor movement and the socialist movement and expresses the aspirations of those things. Typically, we talk about social democracy, we're talking about reforms you know, rather than revolution, but that's, but that like, I think if we're gonna be historically specific, mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about. And certainly, in those countries over which America has, you know, has uh, expressed the most economic and political dominance, mm -hmm. any attempts at doing anything that would be even close to what we have in the United States, never mind, this kind of more extensive democracy has been often met with quite a bit of hostility. And that is a major reason why uh, it's been so difficult to, uh, to implement that in, uh, in Latin America. Can I and offer I an alternate reason for that? Sure. I would say I mean, I um, the alternate reason for that is that the farther you go from Norway, the more transparently insane these policies are. Um, I would love to make you like the dictator of Haiti for um, a year or two. You should actually look into the 1920s and 30s occupation of Haiti because I think that if you read primary sources from the period, you might change your very, um, I hesitate to say, your, your very linear perspective on what was going on there. I feel like in some ways you're sort of a prisoner of this kind of 20th century Cold War worldview, which is itself uh, really an American propaganda construct. So one of the things that you see across the board within the Cold War is I would sort of encourage you to compare the US response to the Soviet Union, for example, to the response to right-wing powers like um, Nazi Germany, where um, you know the idea of we're gonna be at peace with Nazi Germany and have a cold war with them rather than starting a worldwide war and invading Europe uh, was not even considered an option. And Why do the, you think that is? It's, uh, why, why do I think that is? I think that's because America, it boggles my mind how difficult it is to see as an American that America has always been a fundamentally left-wing power. Uh, we forget that Karl Marx praised Lincoln to the skies constantly. We forget that Lincoln's party was the most left-wing party in the world at, at the time. We forget the inc incredibly close and really, um, I would say, culpable relationship of the U.S. with the USSR, not only during the 40s, but during the teens and 20s and 30s when it was committing its worst atrocities. Even in the Cold War period, when the American wait, wait, liberal wait, 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 establishment- wait, 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 the, the teens, when yes. not, only, not only did the United States not recognize the Soviet Union, uh -huh. but Woodrow Wilson sent troops That's right. in order to aid the white armies of the Russian Civil this War. Is exactly, and when you look more closely at what happened, you realize that, for example, I think point seven of the 14 points is essentially hands off the Bolsheviks. You realize that the troops that the US sent to the Russian Revolution were not actually there to suppress the Russian Revolution. They were there to essentially sandbag certain British and French efforts to 
suppress the Russian Revolution, which would have saved tens of millions of lives. Okay. And and so no, that's so, no, that's all true. So this is, this yeah, is, this right, is right. an important this is an important So point you, to you make. actually you have this, to this this really so, is news from an alternate dimension. So here. so so for example, there's a great um, book which is um, a biography. Do you know, I don't. I'm curious as to how you feel about Wilson, but there's actually a biography of Wilson by Herbert Hoover that I read. And it includes this wonderful detail which is in entirely consistent uh, with what I find when I look into the period that in 1917, Wilson was, not 19, 1919, um, or early 1920 was it, Wilson was coming back from his, his grand tour of Europe in which he's received as basically the president of the world mm -hmm. in this in insane experience. And um, who happens to be coming back to him with him is David Francis, who was the US ambassador to Russia. Now Francis was the former governor of Missouri and he was, um, uh, essentially, during this conflict, the U.S. had two embassies to Russia. It had an embassy to the Kerensky regime, and then it had what was called the Red Cross Mission, which was actually basically Wall Street's embassy to the Bolsheviks. And this business of basically supporting revolution around the world had become a very big American business and actually kind of lucrative when you looked at relationships with these revolutionary regimes. Um, you know, for example, the um, um, massive magnesium concession in Georgia that Avril Harriman got in the 20s, uh, that's Georgia, the other Georgia. And so um, Francis is coming back on the same ship as Woodrow Wilson, who's appointed him the ambassador. He's coming back for medical reasons. Wilson won't even see him even though they're both on the George Washington together. And then there is an episode which I find entirely con you know, convincing, but I've never read about before, but I don't, don't see why Hoover would make it up. Hoover, of course, was a big progressive of the era, where um, Wilson sends this cable to Paris and London. And this cable is like, hey guys, um, I've just been informed that you're supporting these whites in Russia. And they're really very bad people. You know, they're monarchists. They're, they're, the term fascist wasn't available yet. They're reactionaries, they're really bad people. And what I don't understand, and what I'm gonna find really hard to explain to the American public, is the fact is you guys owe us a lot of money. Like, and, and that you, instead of paying us back, you're aiding these monarchists, these reactionaries. I don't think American public opinion is gonna to take to that very well. And so, essentially, the sort of cutoff of allied aid to the whites which is what allows the Reds to win that war, was very much a policy of liberal internationalism in Washington. Moreover, you know, you okay, keep okay, using well, the let's, term, let's, you let's, keep let's using not, the let's term not propping more, up. More, moreover here, because we just went over a lot of territory, and I just want to note that all of that adds up to saying that Win Wilson, who, yeah, what do you think I think about Wilson? He's, uh, he's somebody You're who, more of a Debs man, he, right? You saw, he's somebody who, uh, yes, very much so, who, uh, who rounded up and imprisoned all of the people who agreed with me uh, mm -hmm. who were in the United States at the time. I think exactly what you think, I think. But also, note that when we're thinking about this USSR-Nazi-Germany uh, comparison, that the, um, they say, well, look, all we did with the USSR was initially support uh, the, uh, the, the whites in, uh, in the Russian Civil mm -hmm. War, and, but like do it in kind of a half-hearted way and then like cut off aid. So really, if you think about it, it's as if we were supporting them. Uh, and that's being contrasted to, uh, to Nazi Germany where there was certainly nothing remotely like that, uh, that level of attempt to counter that system in 19, you know, 1933 and 1934, and where the United States did slowly get there uh, over time okay. in response not to so, you know, as I'm sure you know and would recognize, not in response to, you know, some humanitarian objection to what, uh, you know, the Nazi Germany's internal system was, but as a response to its global ambitions and the things that it was doing in pursuit of those global ambitions and ultimately to, to defend England against it. I guarantee you that if the Soviet Air Force had been bombing London, that would have played out in a very similar way. I, I think that, um, I guess I would say it, it's kind of 
I sort of want you to broaden your historical reading beyond Howard Zinn. Like, uh, you know, this is, and, this is, this is and, so and, glib and, and silly, so, so, and there is just no trace so of a real I would, argument here. I would here. like to. This, this is I, just, this is just lines I'd and like insults. There's no engagement I'd with rec- any ideas. I'd like it's to silly. recommend a couple of books. Um, I think Charles Beard's history, um, he was certainly a progressive. Uh, and um, so his histories, uh, and, and you know, you'll find a lot of your perspective in early Beard work. Um, I think, you know, reading his President Roosevelt, and he this was going to be most such esteemed, a tedious conversation if was, we do shit like, oh, I'm going to really recommend that you time. broaden your reading. You know, um, this, is, this is the least reasonable way to engage with people. If we want to actually talk about this stuff, you got to cut that out. Uh, sure. Well, you know, I, again, if you don't, I mean, like, I'm sort of hearing these kinds of arguments from authority from you, and like it's what? very true. Like what? Well, like, what would example, be an argument from authority? I guess. Uh, for example, you're like America supported the whites in the Russian Civil War. All historical how is that, authorities. How is that an argument from authority? All historical authorities will agree with you. Sorry. And my point was that when I basically read the primary sources. I find that what was going on was, in fact, the reverse. So, and the, so the argument from authority is that I said something that most historians would agree with. Yes, so that's the problem right. is none of us, even me, the professional historian up here, has read the, those primary sources, not many of them, at least sure. not the way that no, you have. No, 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 no. So and you can't really test this? Of course, of course, of course. You know, and, no. and it's very, it's sort of, when you're basically sort of within the sort of narrative of like most historians appears to you as sort of as broad as the world. But for me, like this narrative that you're within, it's like imagine if you'd grown up in the Soviet Union and you got everything you knew from the great Soviet encyclopedia, which is a work that actually exists. How would I sort of convince you that basically that narrative, which every Soviet historian believes in, is, you know, a fairy tale? Wait, hold on. Um, has the United States government been interested in exporting democracy? Yes or no? Oh my God, since the very beginning. I mean, if you read you know, Washington's farewell address, the farewell, farewell address is a sort of wonderful kind of piece of isolationist rhetoric. Mm-hmm. It's really great and it basically, it's doing no more than repeating basically the essential tenets of classical international law as understood by everyone at the time. And one of those tenets is that one thing that you don't do is support rebels in other people's countries. That's an act of war. And so you sort of read Washington as saying this, and you're like, well, this is like the great American tradition. And then you read about Citizen Genet and so forth, and you're like, no, actually, what you're really reading in the farewell address is basically like a drunk swearing off alcohol. And you know he's going to keep drinking. And so, for example, you see the same thing, for example, in 1848 with America's just incredibly enthusiastic reception of, like, Louis Kossuth when he comes to America. You know, the Kossuth story. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, Garibaldi is a huge hero to, like, Americans everywhere. And, you know, this sense of basically, like, promoting Castro when he comes to the UN in the late 50s is treated like this incredible rock star. I mean, yes, you know, the, America is very well known for its love for Fidel Castro <laughs> oh, and its yeah. attempts to keep him oh, in power. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The, absolutely. The numerous attempts to yeah, assassinate I, I can, the guy. I can, the, uh, I can point you. The, the, I the, can almo- point you almost, the almost literally ended human civilization to stop Cuba from defending you itself to the testimony. Against, uh, against invasion, yes, Cuban Missile Crisis. I can point you to the testimony of the last ambassador to Batista before Congress, describing how essentially everyone at state and CIA was supporting Castro, who essentially got his job through the New York Times, as they say, by having an interview with Herbert Matthews, where he basically presented himself as like the voice, as like the John F. Kennedy of Cuba. That was essentially widely believed by all the cool people in America, all the Ernest Hemingways. Gosh, how long did that last? And yeah, it lasted until basically Castro declared that he was on the side of the Soviets. And, at and that then, point, and then what's happened at that the, point, in the last 60 years at that point, At that point, Basically, uh, of course, you switch to a Cold War pattern where what you see over and over again, all of these patterns that you see make perfect sense if you see the U.S. and the Soviet Union as competing revolutionary empires. And so, for example, you know, let's look, for example, at South Africa. 
Okay, at South Africa, again, you have this sort of, sort of standard, you know, well-worn Utney reader, you know, oh, we supported the regime in South Africa. Actually, the U.S. was trying to overthrow the regime in South Africa basically constantly from 1945 after. What you mean by support is essentially condone. When you use this word prop up, what you're actually saying is that the U.S. is not trying hard enough to revolutionize these countries. That's not all what countries. I'm saying. Not even close. What I'm talking about is the United States supporting coups against democratic elected and when governments you look during and after the Cold War. What I'm talking about is the armies that, uh, that enforced uh, systems like Pinochet in Chile, who, uh, by the way, may have been less Americanized, but is definitely America's man in that situation, uh, that the uh, officer corps being trained uh, in Fort Benning uh, I'm, uh, I'm talking about all sorts of military aid to mm -hmm. these places. This is not not trying hard enough to, uh, to, to overthrow it. And certainly, if you think that the, you know, the United States is acting like a revolutionary empire, uh, I don't know what the cause of this, uh, this revolution is, because to go back to Thad's original question about the United States uh, exporting democracy, I think very frequently the United States has used that rhetoric, sometimes, there's been some alignment between that and what's actually happened. Very often, it's used that rhetoric when there's been no alignment whatsoever between that and what was actually happening. It depends on what's convenient to American interests at any given time. I mean, go back to that Mexican Revolution example, those constitutionalists that Curtis is talking about, the, uh, the U.S. Carranza, Carranza, so, not support, There we go. There we go. Support in. Yeah, so Carranza, yeah, big, big, big Democrat there. They have a, uh, there's the guy who... Um, who basically proceeded to govern just like, uh, just like Porfirio Diaz had, <laughs> and who the United States was actively helping uh, to, to crush uh, Pancho Villa. Right, and, and you're uh, more of a... And try to, to crush you know, the you're, Zapat you're more of You're more of a man. How do, how do you feel and about and Chavez? By, and by the way... Can you, by you, the, and can by you the give way, us a Chavez story? Uh, sure, uh, but I'm going to finish this point first. So, uh, so by the way, uh, they have... In, uh, in the course of, um, of doing that, uh, they have, you know, the, I think, let's just say this, I think that the United States, the idea of the United States has been friendly, certainly in any sort of consistent way, to democracy in Mexico is going to be very hard to square with the historical record. But sure, let's talk about Venezuela. I think if you look at the, uh, most of the time that Chavez was actually, uh, was actually in office, uh, they have, um, like the economic, uh, the economic effects you're, now you're talking about didn't happen yet. Now you can say, you can tell a story where you're gonna say, well, okay, but this was just like a time bomb, that they, uh, they was all set up to do this. So even though those first 10 years in power, uh, it, uh, extreme poverty in Venezuela was, uh, was sliced in half, uh, this was all, this was all you know, predestined to lead to what eventually happened, mostly in the Maduro years. Mostly uh, I think that years. they have a, and in, um, and I think that there's all sorts of stories you can tell about why that happened. Uh, I think some of them, I think multiple ones of those include some element of truth uh, that you can tell a story about currency, currency mismanagement. Uh, you can, you know, can tell certainly a lot of stories about corruption. But one thing that I think is not gonna make a tremendous amount of sense is to do the usual lazy right wing thing and say, oh, aha, see, see what did this is socialism. Socialism did this in Venezuela. When you actually look at the stats on Venezuela, even at the height of Chavez's welfare state, you know, the public sector in Venezuela was smaller than the public sector in France. Mm -hmm. You know, it was barely bigger than the one in mm -hmm. the United States. And so certainly the idea, you know, whatever, uh, whatever your preferred explanation is of what happened there, the, uh, the idea that this is just like an inevitable consequence of getting a little too socialist and this is gonna to happen to your economy uh, is really hard to square with the what's global your, comparative what's your, stats. What's your best example of third world socialism? So when you say third world... I so, mean, not Norway. Not Norway? They have a, so, so why, why is it, you know, tell me your story about why you think that, why you think that what, uh, that what's effective in Europe can't be effective outside of Europe, because I've been really unclear about this this oh, whole time. Oh, wow, that's a really interesting question. Let's take Japan and Haiti as our examples, because they're both island nations, um, and they both, um, you know, um, um, one of them is very economically successful and the other one isn't. So if we look at, we could say, well, the infrastructure in Japan, mm -hmm. 
is much better than the infrastructure in Haiti. So what would be your expectation if we, leaving the governments of both countries the same, we transport all the Haitians to Japan and all the Japanese people so to Haiti? So is there going to be an answer to the question like I just asked that's like come in through Socratic dialogue or yes, are we going to get yes, to it? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, give me your answer first. What, what's my answer for... What's your answer for... For, 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 my why, answer, for why, for why my there's answer, better infrastructure my, in Japan My answer is the same answer given by Joseph Dermaist, I, you know, uh, 200 and, uh, years ago, when uh, someone talked to him about um, the human race and human rights. And his answer is that he had never met a human. He had met Russians and Frenchmen and Englishmen. But as far as these humans, uh, he had... Um, he had no evidence of them uh, whatsoever. So, so it's just it's just about the innate difference between uh, Japanese people and Haitian people. Innate difference or cultural difference, Curtis? Innate difference or cultural difference? Uh, well, design an experiment to separate the two, and then I'll tell you. Okay. Uh, you know, there we go. Yeah. That's that's an interesting answer. So, I, I think that uh, I think that certainly part of the answer. And by the way, useful to this comparison to know which one of those countries is more internally democratic. Not even close. Right, Japan. Japan is vastly more internally, uh, more internally How do you democratic. Define, I'm really, I really want to get a, back to this definition of democracy because in Japan, sure. uh, you know, has been run by has been a one-party state since 1945. It's been run by the Liberal Democratic Party, um, and it's been run specifically by the LDP bureaucracy, which is one of the most famous bureaucracies in the world. And so, um, uh, well, I, I, uh, over which the electorate seems to have absolutely no control whatsoever. Mm. So how you define yeah, de so Japan as very democratic, I think, would get into this. Japan, Japan is much more democratic than Haiti. I know, this I know, is, I know, I know. Is, I'm getting you to, I, I didn't say, I'm getting I didn't you to answer very, the question. Like, I, didn't, I didn't say very democratic, and I answered your question like half an hour ago, but I'll answer it again. They have a, uh, that democracy is about the empowerment of the public uh, to have more influence over policy, to have ways of getting their will done, uh, and the accountability of decision makers uh, to, uh, to the governed. Now, again, it's a spectrum. I did not say Japan is very democratic. Mm -hmm. I said it's vastly more democratic than Haiti. You know, the current government of, ha of Haiti, very much, by the way, propped up by the United States, mm -hmm. and not in some sense the United States isn't trying hard enough to overthrow it, but like we're literally about to like send over some, some troops to mm -hmm. like help that government mm -hmm. hold on to power, which absolutely <laughs> nobody in Haiti voted for, uh, the, uh, the, current, uh, the current government. Uh, and uh, and in, you know, in general, in Japan, uh, one party system or not, they, uh, I, I think that you wouldn't deny that they have much more real elections. They are much less likely to do things like ban wildly popular political parties like Lavalas and Haiti. Like they don't have, like it's a one party state. Like what part of one party state don't you understand? Okay, the part, like, of, the part of how you're using it I don't understand is what you mean because it's so, cause, so cause, let me, cause the, let the me, way the rest me, of us use this phrase, let me, one party, let me, let me the way the rest of us use this phrase, one party state, let me is, propose, is, for, is, for, is for a state where only one political party is allowed. Not, not, there, are, there are several political parties in there, Japan, they elect people there were in their several parliament, part, political they have, Parties in communist, communist East Germany. There were several political parties in communist Poland. This problem is a problem that has been solved of having a completely non-democratic government with a perfectly good simulacrum of government. Here's, here's a suggestion. Let me, let me ask a question to sort of um, evaluate your belief oh in God, democracy in what that sense. Say? So suppose that we say we're going to make America more democratic by rendering government more accountable to the politician who America elects in the only election that Americans still really care about. And so we're gonna put the president completely in control of the executive branch. Would you feel that that made the US government more or less democratic? Yeah. Or would it depend on who was elected? That's a good question. Uh, I, would say, I would say less. I think if you look at, mm. uh, for example, I think it was a good thing back, you know, I've, I've heard you make the claim many times about FDR being essentially like a king, uh, but, you know, FDR felt, still felt the need, even after Pearl Harbor, to get Congress's permission to, uh, to declare, uh, declare war because uh, the norm hadn't been established yet that the president could just ignore that. Now, maybe you think that transition is I a good thing. Stalin that you could, asked that you the Supreme just, Soviet for uh, the same thing. But. That, you can, uh, that, you can just, uh, that you can just go to war without having to, uh, to ask Congress, I think that transition's a bad thing. I think that when George W. Bush uh, started, uh, started setting up um, 
procedures by which uh, people could be held outside of any normal judicial systems, that people could be assassinated by drones in countries that we're not at war with, et cetera. I think that was a bad thing. I mean, most, if you think, if you think most, that's a good thing, then we have a real disagreement. And I also point out, by the way, just, just, just in terms of the effects of democracy on current U.S. foreign policy, or the lack of democracy on current for U.S. foreign policy. You can look at the Quincy Institute. Uh, they, uh, they have a bunch of good information on this. Americans, uh, th you know, 49% to 37% think the United States should be doing more to promote diplomacy uh, to, uh, to end the war in Ukraine. And if we all die due to the war in Ukraine, it's going to be because that doesn't count for anything in terms of how American foreign policy is made in practice. I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad, I, can, can we like agree on that note of isolationism? Can we like, you know, find that like a really good note? Uh, you know, for reference, um, the U.S. was basically involved in a de facto war against, you know, Nazi Germany for most of 1940 and 1941. Um, but uh, that's sort of well, relatively well established. So, you know, the, the, I think the declaration of war is a nice touch, but uh, it came from also a rubber stamp Congress. And, um, you know, but to sort of move past the historical point, uh, you know, sort of, I'm not sure if you really answered my question or not. It seemed the question of whether putting the president in charge of the executive the branch, no. it would not make things more democratic, no. even though it would give the people more power. Uh, well, I don't accept the premise that it would give the people more power. But they're and, choosing and it, and the politician and it seems like who's in fact, power. In fact, when you uh, pitch this, right, mm -hmm. at least when I've heard you pitch this before, you know, so your appearance of the Young Turks, for example, uh, the way that you pitch it is precisely that in your preferred model, which sometimes you use words like monarchy, sometimes it just sounds like you're saying, well, you know, it would still be Democrat, we just have a very strong executive. But in your preferred model, what you see as a virtue of it is that instead of there being public input on specific policies, though only public input is like choosing a wise ruler whose judgment we're just gonna trust for the next four years, and that's the part that seems fundamentally at odds with democratic so values. So, what, what do you mean by public input? Do you mean the like um, notice and comment period um, for federal regulations? Do you mean? I mean the actual ability and practice of the public to work its will. I in, see uh, in, no in, in, such. In I see no yes. such ability. Some Give some sure, examples. How sure, does the public yeah. work its will? Well, here uh, here's an easy example. We were talking earlier uh, during my one-on-one -on -one with Thad. We were talking about Florida. So, you know, uh, my, my favorite, this is an extreme example, but my favorite stat about the 2020 election, my favorite factoid about the 2020 election is that Trump won Florida, but the $15 minimum wage uh, won by a lot more than Trump did uh, in, uh, in, in Florida. Uh, or you can look at what happened uh, just now in Kansas, uh, for, uh, for example, with the, re with the um, rejection by a high double-digit margin of the attempts, attempts to make it easier to, uh, to, restrict, uh, to restrict abortion. Now, those are, those are really easy examples because those are cases where the public is actually directly voting on things. Right. But I how would, do you feel about I would the public, also say How do you feel about the public they, rejection of that, gay marriage? Uh, hold on, hold on. They, yeah, uh, I think that in that case, the public is making a decision that I don't like, but I absolutely think that's better decided democratically so, so than, you, uh, than, you than by the I, I, don't, I, don't, decision. I don't believe in judicial review. I'm, okay. I'm thoroughly on record about this. I think that, the, I think that, um, that we want an empowered, mobilized public uh, protecting basic rights rather than, uh, rather than the courts. In fact, this idea, the popular right-wing narrative at the time, that, oh, see, you know, the people you know, want, um, you know, marriage defined, well, the way the Bible actually doesn't, but whatever, is between, you know, one man and one woman, uh, that the, uh, but like, see, it's these elitists in robes who are stopping that. Actually, uh, whereas that had been very recently true, by the time the Supreme Court decision happened, public opinion has shifted wildly on that uh, in the direction of support for marriage equality. Probably the Supreme Court decision wouldn't have happened if not for that, because they wouldn't have felt that they could, uh, they could get away with that. But yeah, I do think that it's better, for, uh, it's better to establish these things democratically. I think it's very healthy that like in the Republic of Ireland, for example, abortion rights and gay marriage were both, uh, you know, came about by a popular referendum in both of those. I actually trust 
building a majority consensus on a topic like that a hell of a lot more than I trust that the um, that uh, you know somebody on the panel of nine Harvard and Yale graduates is just going to do what I want. Do you think that the, uh, do you think schedule? that the construction of this popular consensus and this is sort of what I really want to mm -hmm. get into in the in the difference between mm -hmm. populism and democracy and managed mm -hmm. managed democracy as as uh, you know your. Uh, your George Soros men will call, for example, what's going on in Hungary. Um, so one of the things that's very clearly established by the 20th century is that essentially control of the media allows you to control public opinion. Public opinion is not a cause but an effect. If you had basically all of mainstream journalism had in the United States had somehow been Nazi for the last 30 years, mm -hmm. everybody would be a Nazi. And so you're basically, when you basically sort of punt things like, you know, and I happen to, uh, you know, just personally agree with this particular decision on, uh, on gay marriage, um, but that's sort of neither here nor there. When I look at basically how public opinion is changed, and to borrow a nice word from Noam Chomsky, manufactured, mm -hmm. uh, of course Chomsky is really going back to, Lip to Lipman when he refers mm -hmm. to manufacturing consent. What I see is simply a machine that could manufacture consent for really just about anything. Yeah. yeah. Fortunately, that's not true, and I think we have evidence that that's not true. Uh, that uh, in some of the very examples that we just uh, that we just went over. So I think that, for example, uh, it's not the case that uh, a that you know 12 percent more Americans uh, support diplomacy in Ukraine than oppose it. Uh, because, you know, what the New York Times and all those people you call the cathedral have been so relentlessly advocating peace and de-escalation in Ukraine. I miss that. I think uh, supporting that diplomacy for most people means supporting the State Department, which is uh, not... Uh, <laughs> I, think if you I think if you look at the, uh, the wording of the poll questions, that was specifically even if there were territorial uh, concessions uh, involved. I think that, uh, I think that something like uh, the, uh, you know, the $15 minimum wage example. I think that that's, uh, I think that, I think there are a lot of cases in which, look, does propaganda work? Sure, uh, it often works for a long time. It's variable, it depends on the issue, it depends on, uh, depends on a lot of other factors. I don't think that seeing uh, the, uh, the, the media and academia as being sort of omnipotent over public opinion is particularly accurate. I think it captures part of a complex reality, but I also think it misses a lot of it. Ben, how many Americans do you think are capable of being democratic, or would be interested in being democratic, would be interested or capable in participating in a real way that you would respect in government, governance? Yeah, I mean, I think it's already the case uh, that uh, that you know that Americans uh, do have some avenues for uh, for public participation, and I think that's a good thing. I think that there are other avenues that you know we could have, for example, by having a much stronger labor union movement. This has historically been a hugely important way for ordinary working class people to have more influence uh, collectively over the political process. That you know that somebody. You know, somebody like uh, LBJ was uh, was mentioned. Well, can I can was, I speak, was, can was, I speak was, to that for a moment? If in, they, in a moment, you can. Yeah, say, if they agree with the union. In a uh, well, they, but I think that the uh, but I think that uh, that in that case, again, if you're talking about sort of um, expression of widely perceived interests, uh, that they have a that uh, that is is there is going to be some. Uh, some collective influence. There's certainly going to be much more collective influence with that mm -hmm. than without that. That the uh, is this going to be good for uh, for the you know for the wages of uh, of people who work menial jobs is a question that politicians are going to have to spend a lot more time worrying about if they're worried about what organized labor is going to do than if they're uh, than if they're not worried about it. And again, I think to the extent that politicians whose natural instincts may not have been at all in those directions, I mean, go back and look at LBJ in the 40s, if you look at uh, what some of them have done in a political environment where workers did influence more, exercise more political influence, yeah, that's a good thing. I think that if people have more free time, which by the way is also something that mm -hmm. can, be, can be a function mm -hmm. of social democracy and the regulatory state and welfare state, uh, if people have, uh, people have more free time, and at least some of them, uh, not everybody, it doesn't have to be everybody, but if some of them spend, uh, spend that time being more politically active, again, that's a good thing, and you're going to get decisions 
that take their interests into account. Again, it's a spectrum. If you just say, uh, do we have perfect democracy? Do we have no democracy? Then sure, it's easy to go with the no democracy option. But I think more democracy is broadly speaking when, a good when, thing, and I'll appeal to wait, the wait example. Can, I'm sorry, but I, I mean, but it seems very clear to me that most Americans, probably the vast majority of Americans, are not only not interested in being democratic, but they're not interested in politics at all. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you do if you want, you want democracy and that, doesn't it require them to be at least somewhat involved in this? Yeah. And, and what do you do if you impose democracy? I mean, it seems to me you're in the situation that the founding fathers were in, where they're looking at streets full of drunks and fornicators, mm -hmm. and they're thinking, well, we're we gonna give these people power over you know, governance. Um, that's still so, somewhat so, the case, but it's now it's just apathy. People play and, and games. And QAnon, watch. QAnon. Let's not forget QAnon. So we're so we're so 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 we're believe in angels and so 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 we're okay. So we're back to the transition to less democracy from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution carried out by people you don't like for reasons you don't like, which somehow is an anti-democracy lesson no, to you. Asking I don't understand that. No, I'm what you want that. to do with the, with the American people. Yeah. With the Americans as, you, as they are. I think, yeah, I think the American people as they are, if they exercise more political influence, that would be a good no, thing. No, if, but they don't want they to have a, point. Okay, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's true, and I'm gonna give you a couple of specific reasons okay. to think that that's not true. Uh, one, go back to the union example. Look at polling on who wants to be a member of a labor union versus who actually is. You know, who would uh, who says they would like that versus uh, versus who uh, who actually does actually organizing a union under current circumstances involves a tremendous amount of risk. People get fired for it constantly. Look at what's happened in Starbucks last year. Mm -hmm. uh, they have, there are all kinds of ways that are set up to sort of pressure and blackmail people into backing down from it when they start. Mm -hmm. But you look at the polls, say, hey, would you like to be a member of a union? Uh, you'll get like several times more people than are actually members to say yes. You get enough people voting in Florida that even though it's not what you predict for the partisan alignment of the state, you get the $15 minimum wage through. Again, I think if public opinion counted more, even in foreign policy, uh, I think that the I think that like the outlook right now for World War III would be a lot less terrifying. I think that like. You know, Afghanistan, sure, if the, uh, if the public had had more control over, over foreign policy, I'm sure the invasion would have happened at the same time that it did. But I also think it would have ended like 15 years earlier. I don't think there's any question about that. That was like wildly unpopular many, many years before finally the, uh, the Band-Aid uh, band was torn off. So yeah, I think that there are, you know, I think that even more people would be willing to, uh, to participate more given less financial stress and more free time, which by the way are social democratic policy goals. True. But, they, uh, but even if you, if you look at right now, people as they are, yeah, QAnon or no QAnon, I think that there are, you know, there are sure lots of wildly irrational things that lots of Americans believe. There are lots of wildly irrational things that members of uh, the American elite believe. There are lots of wildly irrational things that you know, whoever, you know, whatever tech CEO gets to become Caesar, if Curtis gets his way, I believe, right? That they have, so I think that if we're looking not for perfect outcomes, but we're saying, are the outcomes gonna be better or gonna be worse, right? If the 68% of Americans who want full federal weed legalization got their way, for example, mm -hmm. right? Is that better or worse? I think it's better. If, you know, if the uh, large majorities of Americans uh, who want universal health care and a higher minimum wage, you know, Curtis and I, judging by the Latin America discussion, would have very, very different takes about whether that would be good or not. Mm -hmm. But certainly in my book, that would be very good. I will take a little belief in angels in exchange. Cool. Uh, so I want to just, you know, I, I think the, the history of labor unions is sort of a very good way to discuss the difference between populism and progressivism because you can sort of often get a progressive to endorse kind of populism and broadly in general, but when it comes out with its real populist shit, uh, it tends to elect Trump and people don't really like that. And because, uh, you know, people find themselves concerned about all sorts of things they shouldn't be concerned about, like their like personal safety and stuff. And so when you look at the history of the labor union movement in America, I think it's very, there's a clear, to me, populism is basically unorganized, sort of genuinely grassroots, bottom up exercise of political power. And progressivism is basically organized farming 
of political power among essentially a disempowered client class. And for me, the moment in the history of American unionism, when, of the American labor unions, to, like the labor union is just a ridiculous anachronism in, in today's world. Like it can no way, in no way be compared to what it was 100 years ago. And what you see is you see this transition from kind of more wildcatty labor organizations, like for example, the Knights of Labor, which are actually re led by laborers. And when these organizations are actually led by laborers, the problem is they tend to do like crazy shit. Like what was the time the Knights of Labor like massacred a whole camp full of Chinese workers because they were being competed with, right? You know, and basically what you see is a coordination of these supposedly independent movies, movies, uh, uh, movements, until there's sort of no more than what is the SIEU, but a branch of the Democratic Party. Come on, let's get real, you know. And and so you basically see them becoming essentially the kind of controlled, bureau, you know establishment controlled labor unions that you also see, by the way, in Eastern Europe between 1945 and 1989. And so you're essentially, when you're, you're, you're sort of looking at these things and you're like, you know, why doesn't Joe Sixpack who drinks, you know, Pab's Blue Ribbon stop complaining about illegal immigrants and imports taking his jobs away and why, does, why doesn't he vote to contribute 10% of his salary to some guy who was educated at Harvard? You know, I think it's a pretty obvious take in a yeah. way for Joe Sixpack and that's kind of surprising how long he's like kept with this insane program. Incredibly We're, lazy caricature ben, hang on of, one of working class I'll Americans let, you, ben, is in a different galaxy than what public opinion tells you about what most Americans think. Okay, I'll let, hang on one second. So we're going to go to Q&A in a second, but I want to let each of you say whatever you want to say before we do that. Go ahead, Ben. Sure. Uh, I think if you actually look at Joe Sixpack's uh, immigration views as measured by actual polls, which I think are a better way of figuring out what people think, take uh, a broad randomized scientific sample rather than just sort of what's Curtis's impression of Joe Sixpack. Uh, I think that, uh, that you'll find out that actually, certainly by global standards, uh, that, uh, that you know, there is a lot more support for things like a path to citizenship and even liberalization of legal immigration than you might think. I would also point out that Donald Trump, when, uh, when he, uh, he was elected, uh, was really underselling uh, the, uh, the very Reaganite economics that uh, to a great extent uh, he actually implemented and he was going around and lying about how he was gonna bring the jobs back uh, in places like West Virginia where there were even fewer by the time he left office than when he came in. He was going around and lying about wanting a less hawkish foreign policy when he actually uh, tore up the Iran nuclear deal uh, and, uh, and assassinated Soleimani and by the way, sent heavy weaponry to Ukraine, which, uh, which Obama had been unwilling to do, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think it's that now Joe Sixpack doesn't really support any of the social democratic stuff, whatever the polls might say about universal health care and the minimum wage, you know, they're, they're, really, they're really Trumpians. I also don't think it's true that the SEIU is nothing but a branch of the Democratic Party. It's certainly not true that it's remotely comparable to meaningless state unions that couldn't go on strike, et cetera, in Eastern European countries uh, during, uh, during the Cold War. I think if you actually talk to most members of that, they're very aware of the difference it makes for wages, the difference it makes for job security. If you're worried about free speech or being canceled, by the way, uh, then probably the main thing you're worried about America in 2022, unless you're Edward Snowden or something, you're probably not that worried about being killed or, or in prison. You're probably worried about losing your job. And whereas the uh, alleged candidate of Joe Sixpack, Donald Trump, uh, filled the National Labor Relations Board with people who were so reluctant to undermine employers' firing abilities that they sided with Google against James Damore, uh, unions actually, in real life, protect the free speech rights of, uh, of members who disagree with what union leadership thinks all the goddamn time. So yeah, I think that, the, I think that widespread unionization is a good way to make this a more democratic country in the simple sense of giving ordinary people more power over what's going on, and that would be a very, very, very good thing. Curtis. I would say I, I, I sort of, it's sort of difficult coping with 
a level of mythos this intense because you sort of you 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 kind of live within a certain narrative and it's a narrative that of course we all know very well having grown up in a world where basically Howard's Inn is everybody's high school history textbook and 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 the sort of the sense of like suggesting that there are other ways to parse and understand these realities is like hard for someone, it's hard to convey to someone who doesn't seem to have that spirit of questioning per se. And so I think that, that, you know, what I would recommend honestly, like, for you as a progressive intellectual, I guess, have you done a lot of like menial labor? Have you like, <laughs> have you worked in factories and stuff or anything? Uh, I, I, have, uh, I have worked uh, in, um, I have, I, you know, I have worked at jobs where I've stood in trucks for eight hours a day, every day, mm -hmm. uh, loading and unloading tra uh, boxes. That's not anything I would bring up because I actually don't think you know, I think that much like liberals who fetishize lived experience, I think that there's all these constant appeals to what anybody has or hasn't done are pretty intellectually vacuous, almost as much so as saying, well, I pity you because you're trapped in narratives. And if you only understood the truth, which I am a conveyor of, you would understand that I'm right, which cannot possibly be mistaken for an argument. No, it's not an argument. It's, it's, it's actually sort of, you know, because we live in very different realities, we can't really argue. And this is why, basically, rather than encouraging you to read right-wing materials, I want to encourage you to read older left-wing materials. I think that this will give you sort of a little bit more of a perspective of simply how different the time of your sort of, you know, like, how different a thing unions were a hundred years ago from now, and you seem to be sort of conflating that America with this America in many, many ways. And it's, it's, it's sort of, it's hard to like, that's kind of the best advice that I can give you on how to open your mind a little bit, and I sort of welcome. I welcome Jesus the reverse. Christ, this is vacuous I, nonsense. I, I, I I'm going to give you advice about how to open your mind welcome, a little bit. I welcome. We're, the we're, we're here to talk about this underlying issue, sure. and Curtis is is wasting all of his time grandstanding about how he's discovered the truth, and he pities people who don't get it yet. Sure. I mean, uh, you know, when when I talk about uh, things that to me seem like obvious realities. They're not valid realities within your mythos. And so we can't really have that conversation because you're simply referring well, back to facts within that's, that's the story. Why, that's why we should talk less what about history. What a silly waste of this opportunity. Less about history and more about ideas. Um, and so I want to turn it over to you all. Um, please, fire away. Oh boy, okay, we have a lot here. I'm trying to think about the audio. Do you want, should I just? You can just talk, and then I will relay the question yeah, through the microphone. The question, I'll restate yeah. it, so give it a, give it a beat before I, before you answer. Um, I have no idea who answered first. I'm going to go with Tori first here. Okay. Um, I guess the question that I felt was most relevant, I don't know, sort of, is to Ben. It mm. was in relation to what he was talking about, um, with people not being interested in politics mm. in a real genuine kind of way, which I agree with. I don't think people are there would be more people here. <laughs> um, but <laughs> uh, I think the question is like, do you, uh, do you not think irrationality is a result of disinterest in reality? Do you not think irrationality is a okay. result of a disinterest? I'm sorry, I couldn't have phrased that double negative. Do you think irrationality is a result of disinterest Do you think reality? irrationality is a result of disinterest in reality? reality? Yeah, and for people, who are watching this or listening to this later, uh, the setup to the question was about what Thad had said earlier about, um, you know, not enough people maybe being interested in, uh, in political involvement. And so I, I do want to just quickly do both, both halves of that question. So I think that, sure, um, you know, irrationality, um, you know, one source of irrationality can certainly just be a kind of epistemic apathy that you're not... Uh, you know that you know that you're you're not sufficiently driven to you know to figure out 
you know, what's true if we're talking about an empirical issue, you're not sufficiently driven to figure out how to have internally consistent values if we're talking about a normative issue. Fair enough, right? But to connect the two subjects, the reason why I'm so unpersuaded by this as an anti as a argument against democracy, even beyond what I would see as the sort of in principle right that people have to govern their own their own lives, their own collective destinies, is that I'm you know I'm not convinced that uh, that we could avoid that problem by empowering an elite to make these decisions because they can be plenty irrational in their own ways. Again, I think that you know I think that. Right now, we're kind of on the verge of a global thermonuclear exchange because of extreme elite irrationality. I just, Wait, hang on. Follow up. Yep, go ahead. Turn. I was just going to say, the one thing I have to say to that is I think that there are plenty of people in power, and that's like even the powerful have a disinterest in reality, and that's why you can't even, you know, order. I don't necessarily think how, like, we're that close to that, but also, like, I think a lot of that has to do with their disinterest in engaging with reality because it might be less desirable than, you know, just a chill life <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, yeah, so, so, they, so, so part of what you said is that people have, um, that it shows that they too are disinterested in reality, and fair enough, right? But if we agree there's irrationality all around, sure. then what I need to hear next is a really good reason for thinking right. uh, that uh, elite irrationality is less worrying than popular irrationality, uh, and then we, I think, might have at least the beginnings of an anti-democratic argument. Well, I think that there's fortunately, if you're looking at, I, I, it's it's good because I feel like we've we've sort of arrived at some common ground in a way where we've basically admitted that there are sources of oligarchic elite error, uh, as you say, and like I. I really like this skepticism of the Ukraine thing because as far as I'm aware, your skepticism of the Ukraine thing is not, is not really aligned with any particular movement or any particular authority. I think it's just your own personal opinion and I think that that's like, like and it's out of step with what the New York Times wants you to believe, and I think trust me, great. very few beliefs I have and, line up with what the New York Times thinks. And, and yeah, they're normally um, to the left of them. I would say, I would expect, but this one is not because you're basically more pro Putin than the average American. <laughs> well, and, and I would I, I, I would push back against the. Let's not descend that, into that, the that, that makes, Let's that, get that, to a point of agreement. That, that makes you pro Putin. Let, let's I, get, I don't, I don't okay, think okay, okay. that was that was unfair. That was unfair. That was unfair. I don't think being against the war. Uh, um, the, war, the war to rock that, 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 that was an the unfair jab, and I retract I the remark. I want to say that basically, you know, when we, I think when we look at these two systems or, or you know, forms of power, one yeah. of them which we could call um, oligarchical progressivism and the other one of which we could call democratic populism, we both agree, we agree that there are significant structural flaws with both of these ways of governing mankind. And that's why it's so unfortunate that there are only two possible systems of government, democracy and oligarchy. No, for sure. As you point out, uh, labor unions that could actually protect people's free speech rights, actually give them a living wage, etc. Uh, and actually are starting to have many of these benefits from people who are organizing them now, that's anachronistic. We need to go with cutting edge new ideas like monarchy. Mm -hmm. Okay, absolutely. All right, right here in the front. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, another general no, question. Better. Okay. Uh, for you, Ben, you talked earlier about universal basic income, and you were talking about how if you work for an employer, your free speech rights are restricted, certainly mm -hmm. true. You can't say anything sometimes, mm -hmm. and whatever you want. Sometimes you have to say exactly what they say in particular job circumstances. Um, but then you overlay the intersection of UBI and democracy, and you start giving everybody money. I, there's no world that I can see of it. I think this is just a lack of imagination. I think this is human nature, where those people who are controlling that money are not also controlling behavior. And maybe that's being done democ democratically, it's democratic, but just like the aunt of Thad who ultimately wanted something for their money, the government or whoever is controlling that money is going to want something out of those people. If this was a year ago and we had UBI, you would not be able to get it if you were unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. 
whatever the popular democratic feeling is at the time against any particular ideology, those people are going to be shut out. Well, this is very testable. They will be shut out. Democracy will work against truly you, UBI. So how do those square? You're really good at restating their uh, question. Sure, <laughs> sure. So the question was um, going back, and I'm not sure when people are actually watching or listening to this, if they'll have all seen our previous discussion. So, so just to, okay, so earlier during my solo with Thad, he was talking about his aunt, who gave him these like very generous uh, gifts of money when he was like, you know, whatever, starting when he was like 12 or 13 or something. And, you know, and, and he'd get like a hundred dollar gift from his aunt and he was excited about it. But then, you know, then like he'd kind of have to pick up the phone when, when his aunt called and then she'd start like objecting to his behavior and you should be smoking weed and all that, right? So is this, is this a good metaphor for a more expansive welfare state, essentially, uh, the kinds of universal social programs uh, that, uh, that I would support? And the questioner connected that discussion up specifically with um, whether if we had uh, UBI, uh, then, uh, then that would be, uh, then um, that would be changed to a NUBI, non-universal basic income. There, 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 would, there, there would be conditions. In the context especially of democracy and not a strong man who could like hold the line. Yeah, the strong man would actually be able to impose conditions. It'd be much harder for democratically elected politicians to, and I can explain why in a second. But uh, so the suggestion from the questioner, again, just for people watching or listening later, was that specifically last year, uh, you would have been denied it if, uh, if you weren't vaccinated. Now, I point out a couple things about this, because uh, I think it's much better when there is empirical evidence that's available to go with that instead of just speculating about what sounds to us like what would happen. So Alaska, for example, actually does have a small UBI, uh, the Alaska Permanent Fund, uh, that... Um, which is a just bizarrely socialistic thing that exists in Alaska of all places uh, from their, uh, their oil, uh, oil drilling uh, that, they, uh, that everybody gets, gets sent a check. Far as I know, if there are Alaskans here who can correct me, that was not conditioned on vaccination last year. Now, you can say, well, maybe that's Alaska. Maybe that's because the politics of the state. So now we can start to ask questions about, uh, about other countries that have various sorts of universal state provision of services, uh, were uh, were Canadians who, uh, who who did who didn't? Sure, no, go 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 for it. Just keep just keep keep it keep in mind before you say this that I'm going to have to repeat it before I respond to it because people 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 are not going to hear you. Okay, so I am I'm one of those people who moved from Canada mm -hmm. to Florida mm -hmm. to the glorious Republic of Florida two years ago, uh, in in very large part to mm -hmm. get away from what was happening there. Uh, with the COVID lockdowns and whatnot. Um, and there was the denial of medical service to the unvaccinated and a lot of other stuff that went around with it. So the popular will there was way, way, way more aligned with the pro-vax thing mm. than it was in the US. And what you saw was that manifested itself specifically in policy and in denial of service to certain people under certain conditions. So, Everything from directly from operations not being done to people who mm -hmm. weren't able to visit their loved ones in the hospital because they weren't vaccinated. Yeah, so there, there are two very different things that are being grouped together there, and I think it's important to make a distinction. So what the questioner said when he came back in is uh, that he's from Canada, uh, and he moved to Florida because he, he doesn't like the, you know, the COVID policies in Canada. And uh, there was a claim about denial of, uh, of medical services. Uh, and, uh, and there was a claim about uh, people not being able to, to visit, you know, visit hospitals because that was, you know, seen or claimed to be whatever, you know, unsafe uh, because, uh, because of concern about the spread of COVID was specifically when they were unvaccinated. That was the, uh, that was the question. And I would say that uh, I'm, you know, I think we'd have to have a bigger discussion about this. But certainly, one thing that you know, and please just correct me briefly, right? You know, so I don't have to repeat a bunch of stuff uh, if I'm wrong. Uh, if I'm wrong about this, right? But it's not the case that like there was a law passed in Canada saying uh, you're you're no longer um, you're no longer eligible uh, for uh, you know for Canadian Medicare. 
uh, in general if you're not vaccinated. I think what you're talking about are specific policy, you know, specific hospitals saying, we've made a determination that it's not safe to do this at this time because it's not medically urgent and there's this risk that goes with it, you know, because we're concerned about the spread of COVID, which is a very different thing. And then really to connect it back up with, uh, with Thad's uncle, uh, aunt, sorry, Thad's aunt, and, uh, and the larger issue about welfare states and personal freedom, uh, if you have a uh, private hospital that, uh, that is uh, especially in, the, in a more laissez-faire environment, less regulation, man, they could go way further in that direction if, uh, if they wanted to. And there's a reason why you're not getting that law saying like, oh no, uh, Canadian Medicare is no longer universal. Like, uh, like this, this social insurance only applies to, uh, to people who've been vaccinated because even in a context where those COVID policies you don't like were actually fairly popular, uh, we, you know, in uh, the broad mass of Canadians, including, by the way, the majority of Canadian truck drivers. Uh, but uh, even in that context, that would have been wildly unpopular. It would have been really hard to get away with that because of the level of popular opposition that provokes. Because once you've got those universal programs in place, as, you know, people with other politics may bemoan, it's really, really, really hard politically to, uh, to take them away, which I would celebrate. And I just say, look, if you're worried that, uh, if you're worried that the, uh, that if we had the America Permanent Fund instead of the Alaska Permanent Fund, uh, that that would be made contingent, I would just point out how much harder it is to change a well-established social program and, uh, and end its universality how much harder that is than your boss just saying, you know what, I'm sick of you, you're fired. So if you're worried about Thad's, Thad's aunt, private employers, private charity, private sources of funds are going to be a way bigger concern about depending on people's whims and how they can you know, give and take away than things that you get as a universal right of citizenship. Is, so it, so can, I, can what, I interject a little? Sorry. Yeah, you can, go ahead. Go ahead. So, so, you know, there's always this equation that I see in your reasoning about democracy and especially democracy and bureaucracy that it always seems that the things that you like are democratic and the things that you dislike aren't. And so when we look at these specific kinds of policies in Canada, you're absolutely right that these policies are not carried out by these uh, sort of symbolic elected arms anymore. Oh no, they're done by permanent commissions. And they're done nationally by permanent commissions. And so the question of basically what sort of the cause, the kind of we must enforce vaccination kind of hysteria over the last year or two is I think very interesting because it certainly didn't come from popular enthusiasm. It became a popular enthusiasm in some quarters. It became a popular enthusiasm in quarters that are basically very, um, NPR listening quarters, you might say, and the way in which basically that side of the, you know, I, do you remember the amazing flip in like public versus elite opinion about COVID that happened in February 2020? No. Do you remember how in like basically through all of February, the message was like, what you really should be worrying about is the flu. Don't be a bigot. Go to Chinatown and lick doorknobs. Yes. And then Donald Trump, yes. Donald yeah. stupid Man, fucking you, Trump, you changed his mind and was like, You need oh, to no, read more if, leftists. You'd be surprised how many this, people were pointing that out. Just, this, just like with the Ukraine, you'd be surprised by how many leftists yeah, think yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and you know, you can point that out. The meaning of that is sort of kind of extremely dark and disturbing in a way because basically this policy effectively was left up to the whims of Donald Trump. <laughs> because if Donald Trump had come out and instead of saying, oh no, if COVID is real, the stock market will go down and I'll, I won't get reelected. If he'd instead come out and said, you know, General Jack D. Ripper style, we must preserve America's bodily, precious bodily fluids. <laughs> you can guarantee that American elite opinion would have followed basically the Swedish path. And I think that... Um, that, we, and it's remarkable even that Sweden's own bureaucracy followed a, not, a path that was out of step mm -hmm. with basically global elite opinion. That was remarkable. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and sort of, you know, kind of an interesting case of sort of the exception that proves the rule in some ways. But the whole world, just like they went mad for George Floyd, went basically mad for let's take the anti-Donald Trump position in early March of 2020. And I think that there are, you know, in some ways, cases to be made for both perspectives. I'm kind of a COVID moderate, which is, I know is very unusual in this, in this group. Um, but I think the dynamics of where that elite opinion came from uh, tell us a lot about basically the flaws in essentially elite governance. And I think that agreeing with you that there are really systemic flaws in elite governance and there are really systemic flaws in like un unfettered, uncontrolled, unmanaged public opinion is like, I think, an important point of agreement between us and I don't want to like let that form of agreement slide. And I think that understanding, sort of building more of an understanding of why elite governance goes wrong. I also, I'm a, I don't know how you feel about the lab leak theory, but I'm a believer in that as well. Uh, it wouldn't surprise, do you believe in the lab leak or do you believe I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I'm not completely sure, but even to be not sure is great. And, and, and the, because there are very few elite sources of opinion telling you to be not sure. There's some great articles in Vanity Fair actually about the, uh, the lab leak. Um, but most journalists on the science beat are captive to the virology community. And the virology community basically doesn't want people to know that like this was a gain of function experiment that got out of control, or at least even that it was possible that it was a gain of function yeah, well, experiment I mean, as, that got as out you, of control. As you know, right, again, I think that the way, you know, one of my sort of bigger picture uh, beefs with a lot of what you say is that, you know, the way you use terms like left and right uh, tends to be, I think, about um, cultural attitudes, often much more so than it's about uh, what politics, I think, is uh, most fundamentally about, which is uh, distribution of power and the distribution of material resources. Uh, so, uh, so then, you know, when it comes to something like the New York Times, because you see that as the left, uh, then, you know, you're surprised when I disagree with them. Uh, but look, I mean, you know, no, like Noam Chomsky, uh, who's come up a couple times in this conversation, uh, there's, this, there's a story you can find on YouTube, both Christopher Hitchens and Gore Vidal telling the story about Chomsky at the dentist, uh, where he's, <laughs> uh, he's been, um, uh, he's told, his, uh, his dentist asks, are you grind your teeth? He says, I don't think so, right? And then and he asks his wife, uh, Ms. Chomsky, does, does he grind his teeth like in the night while he's asleep? She says, no, I don't think so, I've never noticed that. And they can't figure it out until the next morning she realizes that he grinds his teeth in the morning while he reads the New York Times. <laughs> it, uh, because it pisses him off so much, right? I don't, I, yes. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't like the New York Times. I like, and I know you read this article because you brought it up on the Young Turks, I like current affairs, right? Where my friend Nathan Robinson, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I put out a big thing about this. That's one of the reasons, you know. That oh yeah, no, I, no. I really you know. respected that Nathan Robinson piece, and he's also a very snappy dresser. And, <laughs> and, uh, that's no, easy no, no, comment, said, no comment but, on that. Uh, one. <laughs> the uh, I think we could all take a leaf from Nathan Robinson's page there, and he dresses like Disraeli, in fact. And and the um, it's so good. And yeah, and and so you know, sort of whenever you find kind of the light of independent thinking burning and there are ways in which it can sort of burn in this like sort of fatally flawed like kind of very historically cliched leftist perspective and sort of explode out of that in beautiful ways and like you know one of the ways in which you see these kinds of beautiful explosions of independent thought are very like Nathan Robinson being like no actually I'm going to think for myself on this thing and once I think for myself it's obvious what's going on and so like, so, so so can I if, if I promise this really is a question this is not a this is not a statement yeah. can, can, can I can I just ask a, a okay a yeah so, so brief question, right? Because you spent all this time talking up the values of things that I also care about, about curiosity, about independent thought, about you know, standing outside of established narratives, all of which would make me think that, you know, that you'd be a big fan of, uh, of, of free speech, diversity of perspectives, all of that stuff. So does it seem to you that in dictatorships, monarchies, that those tend to be things that uh, in which free speech and a wide variety of views tend to flourish more than they do in democracies? Uh, that's an excellent question. And I think that, that um, 
you know, if you read Tocqueville, for example, Tocqueville, you know, people are like, oh, cancel culture. This is the thing that, um, you know, was invented in like 2012 or something. You know, Tocqueville in Democracy in America describes it almost perfectly in the 1830s, and he describes basically democratic America as the place in the world that had the least free speech, and I think that's absolutely true. If you basically look at, for example, the latitude of political opinion that you could express in, let's say, France in 1770, it's wildly greater than, than the latitude that you can express today. In fact, the latitude of opinion, there are many things you could say in America in 1850 that you can no longer say. And so, you know, to me, when I basically look at you know, sort of democracy in the sense that we have it today. No, I feel that that the range of perspectives within the entire Overton window is incredibly narrow uh -huh. on a historical perspective and the way in which it looks large to us. And this is sort of why I've sort of been kind of encouraging you to kind of just go wild and go into the Google Books world and go outside the kind of the world of that bubble because just read any book from the 20s. You'll find all kinds of crazy ass you know, for, weird for, shit. For a minute there, you were actually having a conversation <laughs> about the ideas instead of retreating to this smug That's Reddit shit where it's like, oh, open your mind and, you know, rec and, and receive the truth. We were just talking about as, opening as, 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 and as, like, as I, and then as I when have. I, when I sort I think, of show I you the, how to actually do it, you're like horrified. Oh my God. <laughs> Curtis, you cannot be this right. fucking dumb about this. They have a, this, this is not, I'm not horrified by reading shit on Google books, I am sad and disappointed that you're wasting time in what could be a useful conversation doing this posturing about, oh, see, you're trapped in narratives. I've realized the truth. Which is why we're going to go to the questions. Right here. Okay, so I got two questions, one for each, if that's okay? Sure. Okay. Uh, two ben, questions, one for each. Go ahead. Ben, you talk, uh, big democracy proponent, you've talked about polls a bit. Uh, Curtis thinks polls are fake. Uh, in, in that it's a way to manage democracy. Do you think we live under a managed democracy? Mm -hmm. Or I guess like can you kind of the question is to Ben is, do you think we live in a managed democracy? Right. Yeah, okay. and the, the setup to that question was about, about Kurt, me talking about polls and Curtis thinking polls are fake. Right. I, yeah, I didn't say that exactly, but. Not in that. It's, no, well, yeah. I said it more crass because I'm but a simpleton. Uh, <laughs> Curtis, uh, you know, Ben thinks we should help her, Haiti would be improved with, by like raising the minimum wage. Uh, do you think Haiti would be improved by improving the population stock through a sort of eugenics program? Uh, <laughs> does does, does Ma Curtis think... Matt, I'm super curious about that. Curtis should go first. Second, second. <laughs> There's actually... The the, wait, wait, wait. The question is, because uh, we've got to get make sure we get this recorded. Um, the question is... Curtis, do you think Haiti would be improved by introducing a sort of eugenics. eugenics to improve the, the, the human population. stock, the population I'm not, stock? I'm not really a big believer in, in, in um, population replacement in general. And when I think of Haiti, when I think of a place, I think of a people, really. And, you know, sort of the idea of, like, improving Haitians by making them non-Haitian doesn't really make any sense to me. Uh, the question I would ask instead is, um, you know, one of the things that you find in all pre-modern political thinkers is this belief that the Constitution has to be fitted to the country and its people, especially, obviously, the people and not the geography. Because I think, you know, if you move the Japanese nation to Haiti, I think they do perfectly fine. And so the question of what sort of governance the actual people of Haiti need, I think is somewhat unanswered. I think it doesn't look like anything like what they have now, and I also doesn't, don't really think it looks particularly like, like Norway. Uh, and um, the, I would love to see Ben be dictator of Haiti for like two or three years. I think that would be think, absolutely informative. And I think, I think, and I th I think if you think that uh, if you think that I- You could I, just listen to public opinion. That I think that, the, uh, that, uh, that that is how Thing, anything I want in Haiti could come about. Man, you have not paid attention for the last couple no, hours. No, I don't think that, that that could come about, but I'd still like to see it. Um, but okay. uh, I think it would be... It would I would be like wild. to hear you explain your views about this to Haitians. I think that'd be fascinating. Um, um, no, I think that actually, I, if you go... One of the things that I love doing is I love talking to... Um, 
immigrant Uber drivers, and it's surprising. Yeah, Tom Friedman. It's, that's, it's that's like a... surprising how much they their perspective of their own country differs from the perspective that you get from reading the New York Times. If you oh ask my God, most people, Curtis, you don't if, listen. If you ask, mo no, no, because the thing is, you're. To me, like your New York Times thing is you're like, no, I follow the Utney Reader instead. And like, Jesus you know, my, my, my grandparents. I barely were, know what the Utney Reader my is. My grandparents Does were, anybody read the Utney Reader? I, I you know, just, just, is, is, is the Washington Post part of the cathedral? Yeah, they, was, just, they, just, they just called for, uh, it was for the US, it was the current US intervention in Haiti. No, no. I mean, my, my, my grandparents were American communists, so I, I, I recognize this line of, of, of discourse very, very well. And um, no idea what that's supposed to be. They never used use the word communist to me. They would always say progressive. And and so so you know when I basically like lump together when I one of the things that's very irritating when you talk to leftists is you know you'll, you'll basically be ascribe some po policy to like the popular front of Judea and they'll be like no that's a policy of the Judean popular front. We're oh. totally against the people's <laughs> front of Judea. Right? You know and sort of that's kind of the like when I use the uh. New York Times as a metonym for sort of the whole <laughs> space of intelligent opinion. Yeah. Um, could, you know, I, I, I realize I could, I think, that you I think object you could, to being I think you could spend in the, that. Yes, um, you're right. It is irritating to leftists when you say things that lump together things that are at opposite extremes, fail to make basic right. distinctions because but they would fuck not with your worldview. They are very your much. They are very much. So small they are very much they look at opposite. Very, very different. They are very much at opposite extremes. And certainly on the question of views towards American foreign policy, again, there's a reason that, that uh, the New York Times uh, makes Noam Chomsky uh, you know, grind his teeth. If you read uh, Chomsky and Herman, Manufacturing Consent, which is where everything that's plausible and what Curtis says about the cathedral comes from, uh, if, you, uh, if you read that, I think he is, is, he is, very, uh, he is 20s, very point, he is very on point uh, about uh, the ways in which uh, Cold War anti-communism certainly uh, shaped uh, the space of uh, political discourse that could be allowable in the New York Times about how certain reflexive assumptions about American foreign policy did, and certainly about the relationship between the thing that he never wants to talk about, which is the actual power centers in American society, which are not journalists and academics at all, right? Those are hired hands. Uh, you know, the actual power centers in American society um, are people who own that stuff. Uh, and no, what they want, I think, differs just a little bit more. You know, I think that, uh, I think that what corporate oligarchs who own media want is not particularly what I want. And if you think the difference between corporate oligarchs getting everything they want and democratic socialism is a difference between the popular front for the liberation of Judea and the Judean Liberation Army or whatever the hell the Monty Python line is, I, I would just respectfully submit that you're not thinking about it very carefully. Yeah, I, I, it's it's actually it's a super, let's go into actually the ownership of journalism question or the management of journalism question because I think it's actually a super interesting question. I think one of the important you know a lot of a lot of what you of of your narrative, which basically strikes me as almost entirely out of touch with the way things work in this country today, strikes me as much more resonant with the way things worked in, say, the 1920s. And so I feel like I'm sort of, when you talk about co corporate oligarchs, I feel like I'm like we're talking about the ghost of J.P. Morgan and Henry Clay Frick and, and people like that. Or gosh, I think Jeff if you Bezos. actually, if you look at, so, so let's talk about Jeff Bezos for, yeah, for, for a moment, because um, I would be... Um, if Jeff, Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post, okay, um, the Salzberger family has managing control of the New York Times. There is an important difference here, and the difference is it is almost impossible for me to imagine Jeff Bezos trying to manipulate the New York Times, the Washington Post news desk, in order to get, for example, favorable coverage for Amazon. That would be unbelievable to me, based on the limited knowledge, I'm not in the profession, based on the limited knowledge that I have of the way journalism works. Whereas at the Times, the Sulzberger family, which is the last great family of media oligarchs, still has an influence on the managing editor 
and basically the choice of the news. I was talking to, not the person you would think, someone who's connected to like a media oligarch, and they were like, from a left-wing perspective actually, uh, or not a media, like a, a tech oligarch, a left-wing tech oligarch, and they were like, you know, maybe we should just buy the New York Times and like convert it to like effective altruism or whatever. And I'm like, you know, look at the market cap. It's like I could put it on my MasterCard, you know? And I'm like, no, you can't put it on your MasterCard because you can't, if the Salzburgers would never sell to you, but if you could buy that, you would find that you were just another basically sponsor of, of an almost entirely autonomous organization. And that, like, but yeah, if you go back to the 20s and, you know, the golden age of, you know, or the system that, say, Joseph Pulitzer was trying to destroy, the golden age of, like, Hearst and yellow journalism, if you look at Hearst's influence over the Hearst press and you compare it to Bezos's influence over the newspaper that he owns, uh, I would say there are probably four orders of magnitude indifference between that level of influence. And so it's like when I basically think of you as a kind of operating in this kind of caricatured mythos, which I can trace back to the 20s, I think one of the ways that you could have of asking yourself that question mm -hmm. is by going back to when these things were actually true and looking at that reality and comparing it to the reality of today. Yeah, how about the early 2000s? Would, uh, would that be more like the, uh, the 1920s or would it be more like now? Uh, tell, me, tell me your early 2000s. Well, Story. how about MSNBC? Look at the, uh, <laughs> look at the political transformations of that network, <laughs> right? That they, had a, uh, that they, were, uh, they were at one point uh, trying to, uh, to compete uh, you know, with, uh, with Fox for the right wing space. They, hide, they, hmm. they fired the people who were against the Iraq war uh, who, uh, who worked there. And uh, then seeing a better marketing opportunity later, they dramatically transitioned into what they are now, right? Which is the Lib Network. And I don't think- Let's talk you about know, Fox. Can we talk directly about Fox? I mean, we can talk about Fox too, but I mean, the, 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 point, the, the point of the MSNBC example is that's a very direct example of, uh, of ownership making, uh, making decisions that dramatically change what the newsroom looks like. So, yeah, so if you basically talk about, and, and I didn't know that piece of history with MSNBC, let's talk about Fox, which is something that I know basically much better. So the Fox business, like Fox is not the real media. Like, and, and this is something that has sort of only become clearer over time. It's like these sort of idiots who wanted to expose, you know, the sort of Biden-Ukraine corruption by leaking Hunter Biden's emails to the New York Post. They might as well have been leaking them to the trash can or to QAnon or to 4chan. They probably would have done better to leak them to 4chan, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the, the, the sense in which basically journalism that is respected journalism operates by changing elite opinion. Let me give you an example from my own, well, not my knowledge. So I, I, um, I you know, have a number of DC kinds of connections and one of the things I like to brag about is that my mother has actually kissed Joe Biden. And it was not a romantic kiss. Um, it was because uh, she's married to my stepfather who worked on the Hill for Biden um, for many years and um, he, in turn, got his PhD in 1965 in political science from Harvard and then went off to work for Democrats on the Hill, which he did for 20 years. And now he teaches at Hopkins. And he recounts this story. Do you know the name McGeorge Bundy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was in a seminar taught by McGeorge Bundy um, in sometime in the mid-60s at Harvard. And there was something that happened back then uh, when they had sort of more real unions, which they had strikes. And there was a newspaper strike on at the time, and McGeorge Bundy comes in, and of course he has a DC role in addition to being at Harvard. He comes into the room with these like bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, you know, 1960s suit and tie wearing, you know, political science students. He's like, well, you know, Washington can't function now. We've lost our inner office memo system, meaning the New York Times. And, and you know, the effect of essentially authorized kind of official story journalism does not go through the public before it has an impact. It goes basically from one arm of the state to another. And so when the Times, you know, basically writes a story about, hey, you know, EPA isn't cracking down on this abuse, EPA gets on it tomorrow, you know, that's real, that's real power. Fox doesn't have that power. 
And Fox, so, you know, when you basically see Fox going out there and marketing to the plebes, they've basically made a decision to make money rather than power out of journalism. And, um, you know, I believe that's crass and horrifying and, you know, I have the negative opinion about it, but you probably do. But that's, to me, a really, really huge difference. Okay, let's take another question. Uh, let's go to John in the back. Um, ben. Yep. What do you think, I'm sure you would agree with the policy objectives of uh, ESG. Do you think that's a, uh, adequate or is that a representation of democracy in your view? Hmm. Sorry, ESG. Oh. Oh, and it's, a, it's environmental and social governance. It's, um, it's um, destroying returns in the market. Well, it's a code, <laughs> it's a code of conduct, I believe, for corporations that oh, yeah. some governments are starting to impose. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and corporations are imposing it on themselves, right. too, right? Yeah, yeah to, it, yeah. environmental and social governance. Yeah, I think that's mostly epiphenomenal and mostly meaningless. Well, why? Uh, I mean, because I, I think that the case for that having a uh, meaningful impact being most of what drives uh, what, uh, what's going to happen in corporations would, uh, would have to be made. I think the more obvious, uh, the more obvious case uh, would be that, uh, that corporations are by and large uh, interested in um, maximizing, uh, maximizing revenue and that sure, it could be nice, it could be a nice you know, public relations thing to, to slap some of this environmental social, uh, you know, social governance rhetoric on and to occasionally generate some piece of writing that uh, where you know where you you justify what you've done mm -hmm. in those terms, but I, I think it just is very unlikely on the face of it that that would be by and large what would dictate actual behavior. In fact, I think this is kind of a perfect case for you know Curtis has this very antiquated view about the influence of the New York Times, but I think that the um, you know the sort of broader issue here with all of this stuff is who do you think actually exercises power when push comes to shove. And I agree, Jeff Bezos would have no reason that he would need to mess with the news desk. They're never, you know, none of those nerds are ever gonna do anything that would, uh, that would hint at anything that would undermine his interests in any way. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if they would, they wouldn't have those jobs in the first place, mm -hmm. right? You, know, you don't need to interfere. The, uh, the, you know, like the editors who are ultimately making those decisions if they, were, if they had a thought in their heads that would somehow undermine uh, Bezos and his economic interests, they would never have passed through any of the hoops to get those jobs in the first place. But there's a sort of more general thing, which is this view of the world that, uh, that well, no, it's not real power is not exercised uh, by the guy who can say, Jeff Bezos with his ownership of newspapers, with his ability to blackmail entire, you know, not only local but state governments by threatening to pull out of, uh, of areas uh, who can donate vast amounts of money to politicians. No, 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 that's not real power. The real power is, um, is, is being exercised uh, by his well-heeled hired help uh, who uh, who run the Washington Post for him, or who have some sort of like diversity officer, you know, a uh, job in you know somewhere in the corporate structure, and I think that that's just fundamentally wrong. So we have 15 minutes left. So I want to go to another question, um, right here. So uh, uh, Curtis has uh, quoted the uh, motto of the state of Missouri, which is "How its populize supreme as lex." So I, I translate that as the quality of the people, not the health of the people, but the quality of the people is the most important thing. And after listening to both of you and having read some of what you've each written, I think that's actually something you agree on, mm -hmm. that that's the most important thing. Yeah. So if, if we look at a century of progressivism, uh, we, here's what county, you know, we're at the end mm. of that. Uh, we, we spent $22,500 per pupil for education. The state has a monopoly on education, K-12 education. 40% uh, of the students can't correctly label the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean on a map, okay? That doesn't look like I'm getting value for my tax dollar. When, when I look at the defense of the country, we haven't won a war in 70 years, and the amount of money we're spending is incredible. It looks more like uh, a transfer for looting the public treasury and transferring the money 
uh, to defense contractors and various other people involved in the war. When I look at health, 85% of the population is obese, overweight or obese. 40% uh, have diabetes. And I can go down the line. There are some things that government does well, but I don't, I don't see how anyone can avoid the conclusion that progressive government has failed utterly. And why are we even talking about continuing more progressive government? How do we improve the quality of the people? And I don't know the answer to that, but neither one of you has actually touched on that. Do you want to? <laughs> so he, he listed several things that uh, have been government projects, funding of things like education and the military, and we've gotten only bad results. And so it seems to me, it seems to you, you're saying that progressive government has resulted in nothing good, nothing worth supporting. So well, what? I would say it's, it's uneven. Yeah. I mean, there are some things. NOAA, so, for example, National Oceanic uh, uh, Administration, I, that did some good things. Right. And, and there are many other good things that have been done. But if you look at the money, I would say maybe 80% 80 80 of the money separate from Social Security, 80% of the money has just been flushed down the floor. So why continue spending money on, progressive, on progressive projects, Ben? Yeah. Uh, so I would say that it's worth broadening your view out from the United States to the rest of the world. Uh, and, so well, no. America, okay. Okay. All right, all right. He, uh, anybody didn't hear that? He doesn't care about the rest of the world. He's numeric. He's, he, okay, let me know when I, you want me to respond to your question. My, but my question is specifically about the United States. It's going to be a while. I'm not interested in the rest of the world. Okay. He says he's not interested in the rest of the world, uh, which uh, I would just, I think the gentlest way to put this is if you want to have a well-informed opinion or one that has any relationship with reality, you should take an interest in the rest of the world because that's the only way to find out uh, is to have, you know, if you want to... You're not answering the question. Uh, I'm actually going to, okay. if you shut the fuck up and let me answer at some point. You've interrupted several times as I've tried to answer your question, but uh, given more speeches. But in any case... Um, yeah, so if you want to, uh, to have an answer that bears any relationship whatsoever to reality, you have to start looking at, uh, at, global, uh, at global comparisons to, uh, to look at, see, okay, here's a problem in the United States. What are places that are doing this differently? What are places that are doing that differently? How might these differences be relevant to the difference in outcome? For example, you, in you incorrectly stated Earlier, no, I'm going to do Finland this time. Uh, you, uh, you incorrectly stated uh, in, uh, earlier that America has a monopoly. Uh, public schools have a monopoly, which is, uh, which is not true. Uh, that they have, uh, that uh, there are in fact plenty of private schools, parochial schools, plenty of homeschooling in, uh, in the United States. Uh, now, a country where there actually is something much closer at least, to a public monopoly on education is Finland. Uh, they essentially don't have private schools uh, that they, uh, in, uh, in Finland. Um, you know, you can, uh, you can have things that are sort of private schools, but you have to have the same curriculum and it's funded ultimately same way and you can't charge tuition, you know, so it's like essentially uh, this is a place that actually does have a public monopoly on education and they have what's widely regarded including by right-wing charter school advocates uh, when they're looking for, when they're cherry-picking things about it that they like as the best education system on the world. And the, uh, the, one, uh, the one that gets the, uh, the, one that, uh, that gets the, uh, the, best, uh, the best results. Um, and so I would say that there are, in fact, a lot of global reasons to think that the United States, if, um, if it implemented uh, policies that, uh, that have been successful, in, in uh, yes, in Finland, in Norway, uh, and in Iceland. Sure, uh, you know, Iceland actually less, but yes, they have a. Uh, that's the uh, that in plenty of other places. These are some of the ones where it's been the most advanced. Uh, which I understand why Car Curtis uh, doesn't want to talk to doesn't want to talk about them because if you talk about the places <laughs> that have come closest to my preferences, Sweden, uh, then you're going to uh, you're going to get this incredibly ideologically inconvenient result for him that it worked out fucking awesome. Uh, but uh, but even if you look at places that are a lot further from uh, from those sort of Nordic enclaves of uh, social democracy, uh, in many ways and much closer along the spectrum to the United States, you look at your Canada's, uh, you know, you mm. look at your UK's, and you start comparing their healthcare systems, for example, and 
in every way that we can rank those things, uh, that, uh, that, we, uh, that we know how to do them, um, then you know, I think maybe the survival rates for some cancers, not cancer in general, uh, is, uh, is better in the United States, but in almost every way that we know how to rank these things, those do better than the United States. So if you're just gonna make generalizations about what he referred to as progressive governance, Footnote, uh, I think the word progressive uh, doesn't really shed very much light on everything and we'd probably all be much better off if we stopped using it because it's used to describe everything from milk toast uh, centrist, uh, centrist liberalism uh, to uh, up through you know, democratic socialism and we're talking about very different things and we have a more clarificatory discussion about them if we distinguish them, and uh, if we distinguish them, one of the things we'd find out very quickly is there are many countries uh, that have much more extensive welfare states than the United States and much better results than the United States. Can I, can I, I just had a brilliant idea, which I don't know if anyone's thought of this, but like I want Ben's. What if we put the government of Finland in charge of Haiti? <laughs> <laughs> Pro or con? Yeah. <laughs> Then they would get eugenics. Yeah. <laughs> so I have yeah, a slight, yeah, you're, can I, you're, can I answer? You were pretty evasive about eugenics earlier. Can I, I want to, uh, but, but I don't know what the fuck you do think would be good for Haiti. Uh, you've, uh, you've used it as a punchline a lot, but uh, I have heard you commit yourself to very little. Oh, um, um, you know, for Haiti, I'm, I'm with um, John Stuart Mill, who was, when he was talking about... Um, 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 India said, uh, you know, I'm for governing India as we govern Ireland with a, with a good stout despotism. This is the author of uh, Considerations on Representative Government. Um, I think that probably the best government that Haiti had in the 20th century was the government of the Marines in the 20s and 30s. And uh, so I think colonialism is an absolutely fine uh, process for that. I also think that if you basically left, if the State Department could leave Haiti alone for like a year or two, it would come back and it would find a Haitian in charge of the entire island, probably one of these gang leaders that they're having problems with these days. I think that would probably work out actually considerably better than the system that they have at present. It's always, it's always convenient. I, I, so I think, somebody... more, I think more isolationism or more colonialism, <laughs> either of those things would actually be much better for Haiti than the present. I wanna answer you know, your question sort of briefly because I think that in addition to considering the rest of the world, you know, there's a slight problem which is that um, the US and the USSR together basically conquered the world in 1945 and so we live in a kind of political monoculture that came out of these two, if I can use the word progressive, um, 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 regimes that conquered the world. And so I think that we make a very big mistake and we're very parochial when we do not value the experience of the past as equal to the experience of the present. And so when we talk about, for example, the solace populi, we go back and we look at, for example, how, for example, Lord Burley, who governed England under Queen Elizabeth, would have regarded that question. And I think that there are sort of answers in those kinds of directions that would, I think that noting that we agree on that point is like a very, very important and relevant point. And I think that, um, you know, Ben's referred to, I guess, in private of his, his like program of a federal jobs guarantee. I sort of appreciate the spirit under which that's offered. I think it's better than UBI. I think there are other policies that can sort of give more people the dignity of labor in a way that's a little more dignified than I think that that would result in. But like understanding that basically the goal of government is to use absolute power because all governments have absolute power to support the health in the broadest sense of the people is something that I think we can both agree on. Yeah, I would like to give the dignity of labor to people who live off of uh, their stock ownership or inheritance. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, last question, and then we got to go. I'm going to go with Cosper right here. Okay, um, this is for both of y'all. In relation to the, uh, I guess, concept of democracy, what do you think the interplay between rights and power is? What do you think the interplay between rights and power is? Yeah, I don't, uh, you know, the sort of concept of rights, I think, rep 
rests on a kind of misunderstanding of power. People are always looking for a power that's above power, in a sense, and then they delegate this power to the power that's above power, and they're like, oh, this is just a power. So this, for example, is why Ben and I sort of agree on this question of judicial review, where we're like, oh, we'll set a power that's above the power, and it will have the power to do non-democratic things like legalize abortion or ban abortion or some weird shit, you know, or legalize gay marriage when most Americans don't support it. And then magically American public opinion will swing around to support whatever power supports, which is the way public opinion works. And so you're sort of trying to f always, there's this sort of quest for the magic power that's above mere humanity. And I think that that quest is sort of always going to fail. Yeah, I hope any libertarians in the audience realize that they disagree with Curtis way more Hell than yeah. they disagree with me. Uh, yeah. You know, what, what, he's, yeah. what he's talking about when he says U.S. and USSR are both you know, progressive and all that, what he means is they both reflect broad enlightenment values, mm. which, you know, I, and so we have this. They actually both use the we word have, we have this We have this difference in opinion about uh, the last few hundred years and, uh, you know, in the advent of the modern world and the end of the Ancien Regime. More like where, where I think it's a, I think it's a good thing. Uh, so uh, I, will, I will leave people to contemplate that, uh, but just real quickly on this question about rights and, uh, and power, I'd say that, I'd say there's a little bit of a category confusion here, right? One is a question about facts, one is a question about values. I think that the, um, the goals that we may value might involve certain people being allowed to do things or having certain expectations, and that's what we're labeling when we use this, uh, this concept of right, which I think is just a useful way. We've all got normative goals. You might as well admit to that, right? Come clean and, uh, and try to be internally consistent about it. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I think there are various things I would refer to as rights, like self-government, uh, uh, but that is the sense in which I'm using the term. Great. Well. Uh, this got a little testy. But we ended on at this moment of beautiful agreement. But <laughs> I want to say, I think you're both brilliant, and I learned a lot from this, and I can't wait to listen back to it because I have more to learn when I, when I listen to it more carefully. And I want to thank everyone who came and all the great questions, and I'd love for you to just give them a round of applause. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron-exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron-exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more, go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish.